This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. That's the really interesting part of the sport, I think, because you can essentially what it is when we're looking at like the hundred mile distance or anything that's like all day long is you're going to have the full range of the full spectrum of emotions of mental processes, both kind of positive, negative and in between. So it almost feels like you've lived multiple, multiple lives or, or a full life, maybe is a way to say it in that one time period. So it's like a it's almost like assimilation of what you may experience in a long period of time in a very condensed period of time. And I think that's just a weird mental process to reflect upon. And that's what kind of draws people back to it. But I mean, it's a battle too, because if you're looking at it from a performance standpoint versus an experience, you obviously want to minimize the negative mindset stuff. You want to try to keep those emotions and those thought processes at a low. And I think when you can keep yourself from letting those thoughts creep in, they you you end up having better races and it's it can spiral in either direction like i notice like there's there's kind of like this scenario that occurs where in the beginning like a negative thing creeps in your mind it's like super easy just to slap it down and say like mm -hmm. get out of here uh you know i've did the training i'm fit i'm feeling fresh still you know everything's going well at this point in time and you get a little further along in the race and you're starting to feel a bit of the fatigue I mean, a little bit of self-doubt creeps in. You start asking yourself, well, you know, maybe I should have done one more long run or did I did I not quite taper long enough? And those things can kind of spiral into a negative way. And if, if you let it keep going, it keeps going all the way to like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? This is stupid. <laughs> all the way to like, there's another one of these two weeks from now, I'm going to drop out of this one and sign up for that one instead. And then you just find yourself in the exact same situation. So you kind of have to, go through the process i think uh it's why i think the there's kind of a i wouldn't say it's a rule of thumb necessarily but something i think is fairly valuable is if you do a hundred mile or the first time make sure you get it done even if it means like you know death marching is what they'll call it in the alternate community the end <laughs> of the race <laughs> just to say like you got that full experience you experience the highs the lows the full thing the starting the crossing the finish line that release of emotion when you're done and all that stuff uh, so that when you go back to do it again, you have like a template to build off of and you know, or you just have some data to pull from about how your mind's going to work as well as your body so that you can start practicing. Well, what do I have to do to kind of keep my mind from spiraling in a negative direction? Or how do I catch some positive momentum and kind of keep sending it that way and things like that. And that, that just, I think you, you just add to that over a career of running them or a series of running them and it what it's it sharpens it's kind of like any sport with that where you know you always have this balance between the youthfulness that you may have early in your career versus the the wise intelligence that you have maybe near the end of your career yeah that's a really good question it, it it's probably unique to the individual i wouldn't argue that you know david is finding success with his approach uh, <laughs> some may argue it's an extreme version uh you know sam has obviously thought about these things and and uh really probably you know i see those guys as kind of two ends of the spectrum in just the way that they kind of come across in general where like david's like really at you kind of high energy and sam's kind of this calming soft presence and he's just gonna slowly methodically lay it all out there mm -hmm. and i think there's value on in both of those, I think most people are probably going to get a benefit from pulling some from each. I mean, there's times where where I need a kick in the ass and then it's like have the strong Zach tell the weak Zach to get moving. But there's also times where, you know, it's just like, you know, a subtle voice entering my head about, you know, I don't know if I feel quite right now. Should I maybe pull back on the pace? And I think that little subtle voice is best approached with a subtle positive voice where it's more like, okay, well, let's think this through here for a second. You're 40 miles into a hundred mile race. You spent four months preparing for it. Uh, you know, from the workouts you did that you're ready for this. There really isn't any 
real reason for you to slow down or to fall off your goal or your pace or you know reassess what you're doing let's just give this another mile or two and then we can reassess if we need to in in order to kind of figure out if i'm doing the right things or not and i think like in that situation um you definitely probably want to lean more towards the sam harris approach with yeah. that because there's really no reason to it's almost like the same thing you see with like just training and even nutrition to a degree where like some folks they just want to be like kind of like drilled they want to be like yelled at and said like get going get doing this and that helps and that motivates and that helps them stay accountable other people need some softer love with it where it's like you know this isn't necessarily your thought your your fault you were put in this environment that kind of created uh, an atmosphere of lethargy and maybe poor nutritional choices and things like that and and like so but it's it's correctable so we need to we need to step away from that and we need to kind of start heading in the direction that we know is going to bear fruit down the road and that person may respond better to that so i think both those guys have great value with their approaches they're just probably polar ends of the of the spectrum and I think most people are probably going to benefit like anything, right? You get the polarizing ones and those are going to work great for the polarizing people, but then most people are going to fit somewhere in the middle. So they're probably going to be able to kind of pull from both of those if they're able to sit down and kind of like assess which one's going to work better in which situation. I think a lot of times when the quitting voice kind of comes in, it, what it does is it kind of just, it, it comes in with the added disadvantage, I guess, in this situation of being kind of a narrow scoped view where you're looking at like uh, what it's doing to you in the moment or how you're feeling in the moment versus how are you feeling about the whole process. Yeah. So one thing that I started doing in 2019, and I think I don't think it's necessarily uh, I think I think I think this was a big reason why I had one of my best racing seasons in 2019 that i had had to that date. Uh, it was part of it was I started, I think, putting a little more emphasis on the big picture versus putting emphasis on like, this is one opportunity or one day of work. Uh, and this is one, one emotional kind of flare up. But how does that actually relate to my general broader picture? So when I decide to do a race or an event or something like that, it's often four or six months out ahead of time, you're planning to like kind of do a series of workouts and a, a, a flow of things where you're going through the process of getting fit, getting ready, preparing for the specifics of the day and all that stuff. And then you get to the race itself or the event itself. And it's very easy to look at that and think that's in isolation. Like I'm going to run 12 hours today or I'm going to run hundred miles today or whatever it ends up being. And it's a lot easier to quit when you think to yourself, I'm 40 miles into a hundred mile race. You know, that's just a 40 mile run, which sounds kind of silly I think, to most people, yeah. but, but in perspective, I mean, we're talking about the ultra marathon running community. You know, it's a lot easier just to say like, well, you know, I'll scrap this 40 miles and try again. It's a lot harder to say, I'm going to scrap the entire last four months, the entire reason why I was doing it, the countless hours I spent in there. So I think I just try to reposition it of like, I'm in a bad place right now, maybe in my head, or I'm not, I'm hitting a low point here, but I'm 99% of the way towards the goal I set out four months ago when I add in all the work I did leading up to that. So I think it's important to ask yourself why, because I mean, there are times when you're doing something and you ask yourself why, and you don't have a good reason. And then maybe it is advantageous to step back and, and really reflect on that and decide, is this something I actually want to invest time and energy into? Because, yeah. you know, someone like yourself who is very much into a variety of different things, it can be easy probably to overextend and get, I mean, I'm a very curious person. So there's like a hundred things I would love to do if I wasn't doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And I know I'd enjoy all of them. So it, at a certain point though, you have to say, okay, which one is going to be the most meaningful for me? And if the answer keeps coming back to saying, I guess this is still the most meaningful to me out of that hundred things that I could otherwise be doing, then, then I know that I'm in the, in it for the right reason. Then I just need to identify some of the things like, well, why did this one take the top spot out of the hundred things that I could have picked from? And keeping like a list of those in your head. So that when you get to that point where you start saying, why am I doing this? Why am I here? You just have those kind of ready loaded in your head to say, well, I already took inventory on that before I started this. And I knew this voice was going to come at some point, whether it's early, middle or late. And, and, and then you just remind yourself kind of what you were thinking when you had a little more of a level head. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. And I think it actually resonates with a lot of ultra marathon runners because there seems to be a trend when you have someone who's been in the sport for a long time where there's a point where they start the sport, right? And they're like super excited about everything. Everything's new. Uh, it's very easy not to quit because you're like, oh, this is the first time I've ever run a 50 case, the first time I've ever run a 50 miles, the first time I've ever run a 100 case, the first time I've ever run a 100 miles and so on and so forth. And when you're doing that for the first time, I think there's a heightened uh, motivation to not quit because you don't want your first attempt to be a failure. Yeah. Uh, and then you get a little further along and you start reflecting on the landscape and all the opportunities that are out there and you find yourself quitting on an event and there does seem to be a trend where once you do that once, now all of a sudden, like you like you described perfectly, that quit pops up in your head maybe a little sooner the next time yeah. or maybe a little bit before. And I've certainly had these experiences in my career as well. And what happens, I think, if you stick with it, um, again, I think it is important to assess whether you really want to be doing what you're doing. But if you start recognizing that about yourself in a certain activity where it's like, I think I might be pulling the plug early on some of this stuff. Uh, I, th I think you just need to kind of get into a position where you just, at that point, you need to make a decision. Do I want to keep doing this? If the answer is yes, you hold yourself accountable to not quitting. And eventually what will happen is you'll find yourself in a position where I'll use ultra marathons, for example, where you're just clicking on all cylinders for that day. And you still get those scenarios where doubt creeps in your mind. You have these low points, but for whatever reason, when those low points come, you're able to push through them better than you would have in the past. Mm -hmm. And then you push through maybe two or three more than you did after you had quit the time before. Then it's accountability time, right? Because then you have to look back at that and say, well, why did this time was I able to be mentally more strong and kind of push through those, those, uh, those extra opportunities to quit when I wasn't before? And it can be easy to look back and say and live kind of like retroactively in the sense where you're like regretting, well, why did I drop out of those races? Why did I do this wrong there? And, and that, and I just think that's where you have to kind of catch yourself and say, no, those, oper those things happened to me in order to put me in a position where I decided, well, this time I'm not going to quit no matter what, you know, minus my leg falling off. Uh, like I'm not going to quit. And then you put yourself in a position to have that day where you push through more times than you ever have before. And you just redefine what you're capable of. And then once I think you do that, you start looking at those earlier lessons as, as lessons, you know, were they failures on paper at the time? Probably, but can you pull things from them to learn as to like, well, where is your actual threshold? Where is the limit actually for you? And then kind of start redefining that stuff. Um, so I think like the never quit mentality can be good in certain situations, but I don't think it's necessarily like a, like a holistic thing where, you need to be in something where it's, it's never quit, always do more. Because then you end up in a situation where you find this like margin of diminishing returns, especially when it comes to training and workouts and things like that, where there are times where uh, often there are times where you want to actually quit a little bit before you would have to because the stress that was required to elicit a, a, a growth response has already occurred. And just to do more is just going to require more recovery time to get back and do it again. I think people need to get that in their life. I think they need to have situations where that becomes kind of the reality for them so they can see that avenue, experience that avenue, um, where I think it's maybe to the extreme as if it becomes like your entire life philosophy where like every little thing you do is never quit. Yeah, so there's probably a couple sides to me with that kind of a thing where for one, I think when we talked about the why, so like, I think the why can kind of shift a bit and it probably will if you do something long enough or evolve maybe is a better way to call to put it. And for me, like one of my big drives and one of my big passions within ultra running is to, first of all, find an event that I really, really love to train for and participate in. So for me, I feel like I've kind of identified that to a degree and that's kind of runnable hundred milers. So once I found that it became more of a driver for me to see like, well, how fast can I run hundred miles in a very controlled environment? So let's eliminate weather, let's eliminate, you know, 
elevation, let's eliminate like having to wait extra long to get crew or support and that sort of thing. And that's how you find yourself on a 400 meter track running a hundred miles. But for me, like that, the important part of that is that I can control the environment enough where if I come back year after year, I can retest myself and have a decent ability to kind of say I improved or I regressed or I stayed stagnant. And I think that's a big driver for me. Um, but one thing I've recognized within that is if you just keep doing that, like if I could probably pick three flat runnable hundred milers a year and optimally prepare race, recover and repeat without like burning myself out. But one thing I think I learned also in 2019 was, uh, that sometimes you kind of need to step away from some of these really, really kind of important markers in your like your performance or in whatever you're trying to do and take a step away from it and try do something a little different uh in order to kind of hit the reset button on just like what i would call just like your mental energy to be able to continue to do it at a high gotcha. level so almost like happiness <laughs> exactly well and here's the example like i mean i love running in trails too most people would consider me a flat road track runner runnable ultra runner um but i like to do trail runs too so in at the end of 2018, I recognized that I had been kind of pushing the gas pedal on trying to run fast 100 milers for quite a while without really a break in that where it was like, okay, I did one. Now I'm going to you know, take a brief off season, but then I'm going to ultimately build up and peak for another one. I might introduce some fun trail races in the context, but they're going to be B races. They're going to be training races, time on feet type of stuff that are going to kind of mimic like a long run essentially. And, uh, but the main focus, the always in the back of my mind was like getting on the track and seeing how much faster I can run a hundred miles. And that just kind of that energy that it takes to continually think by that, that I think the motivation to keep that stoke high enough to really meet your full potential fades if you don't step away from it for a little bit. So I took essentially half a year away from runnable stuff and just decided I'm going to prepare for the San Diego hundred mile, which is like a much more elevation a technical trail type of an event. Is that a trail run or no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a trail hundred miler, uh, actually just technically just outside of uh, uh, San Diego. And yeah, it goes through, it goes over part of the Pacific Crest Trail and stuff. So it's, it's very different than running on a runnable surface. So to give you some context, like I ran, was it, I think just under 17 hours for that race. Whereas on a flat surface, I can run 11 hours and 19 minutes. So just wow. the environment alone added an extra you know, five plus hours to the day. So um, it's just a different experience, different skill set. And what it did is it allowed me to kind of step away from kind of focusing on like splits on a track, uh, running flat stuff, like preparing for things specifically for a flat environment and start training for something that's more climbing and descending, more technical running skill sets and things like that. And the cool part about it was uh, first of all, you know, when you step away from something and enter something a lot different, I mean, it's still running. There's still a, a huge advantage I had from the running I'd done in the past that was going to put me in a good position to be successful. Mm -hmm. But there was a much higher uh, or a much bigger range of potential improvement for me. So through the like, you know, four plus months I spent preparing for that race, you know, I noticed, oh, wow, I'm getting faster on this climb mm -hmm. or I'm getting better at descending this technical trail. It was one of the most fun races I've run, actually. So it was kind of a cool experience. I ended up uh, taking the lead at like 93 miles. So. so you were racing, racing, like you were trying to get first. Mm -hmm. So it's still a race. Yeah. So uh -huh. what was yep. the enjoyable aspect of it? I don't think I recognized it so much while I was doing it, actually. It, it surfaced afterwards. I mean, the enjoyment of the race itself is like when you find yourself in a position where you're sitting in basically second place all day long, and then you take the lead at mm. 90, I think it was like 91 or 92 miles. Nice. It's like... Yeah, that's kind of a cool way to race. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, but afterwards, I recognized a few things just about kind of pacing and, you know, how to maybe pace the first half of a hundred miler versus the second half. I also recognized shortly thereafter, uh, once I finished, recovered and decided my next event was going to be a flat runnable race that, wow, I really was way more excited to do the workouts that I needed to do to get ready to run a fast, flat hundred miler. And I don't think that would have been the case had I just tried to do another flat, fast hundred miler earlier or during that year and end up in a situation where like I maybe had like normalized a suboptimal like uh, outlook mm -hmm. on like something that I had just done so many times already. Yeah. 
And I recognized that it was just every workout I did, I was like, I, I did this workout a year ago and it was not nearly this much fun. <laughs> and, or, you know, you, and then the interesting thing about these track hundreds too, is like, you find yourself doing like your peaking phase where you're running your long runs, which for me are usually like, you know, around 30 miles or so. And I'll do them on back to back days. And, you know, I try to replicate the environment I'm going to race on. So I'm finding myself on a 400 meter track. Yeah. And it's like, when I started doing that again, I just felt like I was super motivated to go out there Saturday and Sunday and do those back-to-back -back long runs and see the progress and then head out again the next week and do it again. So I had some of my more enjoyable long runs, which are going to be the most specific to the race day environment that I had in quite some time. And I think that was really beneficial and kind of putting me in the right spot to be able to push through barriers on race day and put me in a position where quitting was going to be much less of a likelihood given the enjoyment I had in the months leading into the race itself. Yeah, I mean, I think people probably overestimate what it takes in terms of just getting it done. I think this is consistent in just running in general. I think the marathon was always a big one with that where people thought like, well, you have to do this training or you just literally won't physically be able to complete a marathon. And then we got into an era of kind of like, running as more of an enjoyment thing versus a performance thing. And then you'd have people running granted much slower. I think if you look at the Boston Marathon, average finishing times, it goes from like, or maybe it wasn't the Boston Marathon. It might've just been marathons in general. It went from like three hours to five hours or something like that. <laughs> so it's like people, I think, got past the fact that you can only do it if you're optimally prepared to, well, I can do it and maybe not meet my full potential if I'm going to like not do much training, which I wouldn't necessarily advise. But uh, I mean, I've, I've talked to people who basically run a hundred miles, sometimes almost off the couch. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it, to me, what that says is just the human body is incredible and what it can tolerate above and beyond what it's been exposed to if it has to, or if it feels like it has to. Yeah. I think, uh, once you start putting marks or goals on outside of just finishing, that's where it starts getting interesting. Cause now you can maybe go in with multiple goals where like if one falls off, due to something that you didn't expect, then you have another one to target. But you can always build those up and try to think like, well, I want to run faster than last time or I want to you know, break a course record or an age group record or something like that. And that, that I think is just going to be a little bit of a different mindset because now you're looking at every little thing from what do I need to do to prepare as well as what do I need to do to be efficient on the day itself? So like transitioning aid stations and things like that, or uh, do I want a pacer or not? Or does this race allow someone to like hand me a bottle at a certain spot? Or do I have to be in specific areas to get cool. that type of stuff? And, and it, what it ends up doing is it ends up bringing a lot more variables to the table. And I think it's, it's interesting because there's always going to be more variables on the day uh, than you are able to account for. So at a certain degree, you have to kind of find yourself in a position where I'm going to make sure I take care of the big ones or the ones that are like, obviously I need to be ready for like mm -hmm. my fueling strategy, my hydration strategy, my pacing strategy, you know, what workouts are going to put me in a position to physiologically have this process go as well as possible. How am I going to like, you know, hold myself accountable in aid station transition. So I'm not like having a ton of non-moving time. Uh It's almost like moving from checkers to chess, right? Yeah. You have like, you know, or maybe even like connect four to <laughs> chess or something <laughs> like that, where it goes from just kind of like, well, one foot in front of the other. And when I get to the next aid station, I'll just eat whatever looks good, drink whatever, you know, quenches my thirst and then move on to the next one to like, well, which one of these food products is actually going to make me move a little faster to the next aid station? Or, mm -hmm. you know, which one of these pacing strategies is going to get me to the finish line faster than the other one and, and that sort of stuff. So uh, it gets more complicated, more interesting. And, uh, in my opinion, anyway, also there, I mean, but there's a breaking point with that too, because like I said, there's an endless number of variables you could account for. And as a distance gets longer, that list gets longer too. So you find yourself in this position where, where you have to, at some point say, okay, I've accounted for everything I can reasonably account for. Now I need to be in a mental space where when something happens that I wasn't able to account for, I'm able to respond to it with the right decision and keep going and not dwell on it. Mm -hmm. Cause that's another thing. I mean, you're running slow enough when you're doing a hundred miles where if you make a mistake, you can sit there and just fixate on that mistake and say, why did I do that? That cost me 10 minutes, blah, 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 blah. When in reality, what you need to do is that happened. Everyone else out here is going to have a situation like that at some point. Mine happened now. Uh, I need to figure out how I can move forward at the fastest sustainable pace 
and not think about what happened back there. And that's where I think it gets really interesting. What uh, would you say it takes to set a world record in the 100 miler? First of all, I think you probably have to focus on that specific event. Um, I mean, there's the interesting about ultra running where it maybe deviates a bit from just other endurance sports is there's such a wide range. I mean, we talked about it a little bit when I talked about the San Diego 100 versus kind of the flat runnable stuff. So yeah, yeah. So there's a few that really stand out. I would say the three biggest ultra marathons right now, even from a historic, maybe not necessarily a historical standpoint, but uh, in in modern day ultra running is going to be the Western States 100. Uh, That's the biggest, most competitive 100 miler. It's on the trail side of things uh, in the United States. Then there's Ultra Trail Mont Blanc, which is probably the most competitive 100 miler on the planet right now. In previous years, it's been debatable as whether Western states or Ultra Trail Mont Blanc is more competitive. I think in the most recent few years, you're just seeing a lot more like of the bulk of international talent on the trail side of the sport heading over that way. And then you have the road running side of things where the Comrades Marathon, which is technically 56 miles, but they call it the Comrades Marathon, uh, is going to generally be the most competitive ultra marathon. The, the weird thing is the distance thing, right? Because most people when they think of endurance sports, they're thinking about precise distances, like mm-hmm. five kilometers, 10 kilometers and all that stuff. And then, then you get into the ultra running world and it's like, sometimes it's the event. So like the Western the course States, itself is much more important than the distance. Right. Yeah. So the Western States 100 is actually 100.2 miles, which isn't that big of a deviation when you think about it, especially when you figure like tangents are going to probably account for more than 0.2 miles on a hundred mile race. But the ultra trail Mont Blanc, you know, that's, listed as a hundred miler, but it's actually, I think like 104, 105 miles. So, you know, it's more, it, there's different cultures too. So the United States is definitely more motivated, I think, to try to get as close to the exact distance. You're going to hear maybe a little more grumbling if someone says, I signed up for this hundred miler and it turned out to be 103 miles Yeah. Uh, versus like over in Europe, they don't really care too much about the distance. They're more interested in like a specific route or a loop. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely hard to compare. I mean, there's events that um, take, for example, um, I would say the best ultra marathoner in the world today on the men's side is Jim Walmsley. Uh, the reason I think Jim Walmsley is the best is because he is the most versatile and not only is he the most versatile, but he's arguably the best at almost everything up to 100 miles. So there's a race called the Angeles Crest 100 miler. They, the, the trail has drastically changed from when they originally had that event and it's a different time of year. So it's much warmer on that course. And Jim's not the kind of guy who would, uh, sit back and say like, I can't chase that record. But I think Angela Crest, when he looks at the segments and the pacing for that one, he's like, that one is maybe not even the same event anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have that, you have some that are a little more controlled and a little more kind of like preserved, I guess you would say, but I think it gets really rare on the trail side. I mean, Comrades is going to be very comparable from one year to the next because that's a road race. And that's where you get, you maybe get like the split in the sport from people who really want that kind of like, I want to compare myself to someone who ran this course in 1970 versus like someone who just says, I want to be competitive today. And, you know, maybe the weather is going to be 30 degrees different from one year to the next on this course. But if I beat everyone on this day, then I'm the champion of that big named race, like Ultra Trail Mont Blanc or Western States 100. And my legacy will be cemented because I won that big race. And it doesn't matter when or how the course was or what the time even was to some degree. I mean, it evolved a bit. Like, I think the, as I learned more about just like what is required to kind of really do that stuff. So there's some variables you can control for. You know, I try to control for as many as I can. The big one that kind of stands out that you can't necessarily control for is it's pretty rare where you get an event where they're just doing a hundred miles on a track. It's usually like a, like an event of like a series of different events where they might be like some people out there doing 50 K some people out there doing 24, some day, like the event I did at there's six day folks out there. They're trying to see how far they could get in six days. So you have like this, much wider range of pacing just due to like the distance. So, you know, track protocol is always like you pass on the outside. So if you're running one of the faster paces of the day, um, which when you're going up to six days, you're going to, and you're doing a hundred miles, you're mm-hmm. probably going to be running faster than most people out there. Then, you know, you just end up running more because you end up running in lane two around the turns and then sometimes lane three around the wow. turns. So it's down to those little details mm-hmm. that have a big impact. Yep. So I had to build that into my pacing strategy. I also have to build into the pacing strategy, like 
relative non-moving wow. time. Uh, you know, I did a race just recently. Uh, it was the U.S. Track and Field Hundred Mile Road Championships, and I did not stop once, other than like I guess I technically stopped like in the aid station for like a few seconds to like grab bottles and get myself wet because it was like 94 degrees that day. But I didn't like stop at all during that race from like what I would say is like a long period of time where we're getting up to like a minute. But that's pretty rare, even on the track. Like when I ran 11 hours and 19 minutes, uh, I think I stopped three times for maybe a total of like, I believe I have to look back for sure, but I think it was like three to four minutes or something like mm -hmm. that. So you gotta, you gotta figure that into your pacing strategy, especially if you're chasing a specific time. Because, you know, if I'm pacing for, you know, at the time the world record was 11.28, um, so if I'm pacing for say 11, 27, 30 or something like that, mm -hmm. and I don't account for that three minutes of stoppage, then I might run the exact pace I had planned on, but then I'm a minute off of the world record. Yeah. So that world record that I broke actually just recently got rebroke, <laughs> um, by a guy, um, over in Lithuania, uh, Alex, uh, Sorkin, um, phenomenal race. I mean, he's he's won the 24-hour world championships. He's won the Spartathlon, which is another big historic ultra marathon race. It's 153 miles, so it's getting a little more lengthy than some of the stuff that I've traditionally done. Um, he ran 11.14, I believe it was 56 or 57. Um, so his pace was 6.45 per mile. Mine was 6.47 and a half in terms of just like the pacing strategy. I mean, it's, it's just really cool because for me, the motivation with, chasing the world record was it was multifaceted i think there was as i kind of moved through because i mean it took me almost six years from the day i decided i wanted to chase that time to the day i actually did it uh and through that five to six years i think i merged from just like my number one goal was to try to break the world record to my number one goal is how fast can i run this thing and then ultimately um, what needs to be done for a human to break 11 hours in a hundred miles. Cause I think that's going to be, I think that's going to happen wow. soon. I yeah. think it's going to happen in the next few years. What pace would that be? Um, sub 11 would be, I think like, I think it's like 635 right about per mile. You're moving quick, but not so quick that like you're, you're, you know, void of being able to think about everything as it's happening. <laughs> Yeah. So if you're talking about someone, let's say that there's someone, well, let's just take me for example. Let's say that we could just like, we had this infinite knowledge and we knew for a fact, a perfect performance for me would produce a 1059, but I'm not going a second faster. And I need to do everything right in order to run a 1059. Uh, I would definitely want to either have a slight negative or a slight positive split. So when, um, and I think there's, I think there's a, there's a range in there where like, being a little bit faster the first half than the second half isn't going to necessarily change your outcome or being a little bit slower the first half and a little bit faster the second half isn't going to drastically change your outcome. So that's what you're referring to the split is you're looking at the first 50 miles and the second 50 mm -hmm. miles. And you can break it down as, as tiny as you want. Like I think uh, when you take out the outlier laps where I stopped to use the bathroom, which would have been that like three to four minute non-moving time that I talked about before, my splits were really tight. Um, I had a couple that were, um, it was weird cause that, that track that I did that on was actually like 400 and some weird number, like 400 and like 38 meters or something like that. So I actually like ran like my numbers based on that. So they're, they're normally I'm dealing with 400 meters and then it's a little more like clean as to like what my lap splits are going to range from one event to the next. Yeah, they'll switch directions at most events every four hours. So you'll do four hours one way and then they usually put a cone out. And once it hits like, like let's say it hits four hours, you finish the lap you're on and then you do a loop around and then you start the next, your next lap. Yeah, gosh, I, you're making me wish I would have strapped more like a foot pod to my <laughs> <laughs> But like, yeah, so I think like, my guess is it's pretty precise. Like it's... We have the same definition of fun when you, I've got my find myself on a track for all day and, and you find yourself counting foot strikes. <laughs> I think my guess would be that at the individual level, it's going to be pretty precise, assuming the pacing is consistent. So you get so my pacing on that day, 
I ran two minutes faster the second 50 miles than I did the first 50 miles. So my splits were very even most of the day. I actually ran some of my fastest miles at the end. Uh, so there's going to be probably a slight variance from my fastest mile to my slowest mile in like your cadence or your foot strike. Uh, but probably not by a huge margin, but you might have a pretty big variance from one person to the next. So mm. you get someone whose gait is just a little bit different. So like for me, I supinate, which means I kind of come down on the outside of my foot and I'm kind of more of a mid four foot striker. So that's going to kind of impact my cadence to a degree. Whereas you might have someone who is kind of more mid to rear their foot or heel striker, and they might pronate where their foot kind of rolls in. Uh, so that person may have a little bit of a different cadence as well. So you get someone, and I think you see this in elite marathoning too, which is going to probably just be a much larger data pool, uh, much, much more probably precise from just like a number of opportunities to study this. And I think even their ranges from one person to the next can be, I wouldn't say drastic, but you know, to the degree of like 10 to maybe even 20 steps per minute or something like that from one person to the next. But most people, the faster they go, the higher their cadence is going to be. The slower they go, the lower their cadence is going to be. But there's going to be probably a range of optimal lowness and I don't know, about op probably an optimal highness too mm. than that. Yeah. <laughs> Intuition. I mean, I would, def I would be lying to you if I said I didn't want to be the first person to break 11 hours and 100 <laughs> miles. I think that'll be... Um, would be a, a cool like barrier to be the one to usher that in. But with that said, I think I'm much more motivated in seeing it done from the sense that like, I think I, when I'm, when I'm, when we're talking about records, it's something that is inevitable that it's going to get broken. So, I mean, we were talking about happiness before this, right? So I've contemplated this in the past um, where I was thinking to myself, like, uh, if my motivation is to break a world record or any record for that matter, course record, and have that be my defining reason or my defining motivator, I probably need to do an assessment of what I'm kind of where my mind is at and where my focus is at uh, and just reflect on how I'm behaving in life because it's going to get broken, right? I mean, I could run 1050 tomorrow and in 10 years, chances are that's no longer going to be my, the world record anymore. Someone's going to run faster than that. So if you're living to hold on to a record versus living to try to move the sport forward, which anytime you break a world record, you're moving the sport forward, then, then you have to look at that as like, that was my contribution. And whether I contribute again or not is kind of besides the point. What you want is that your performance, your contribution brings new people into the sport who are excited, motivated, and they can make their contribution. And then we can ultimately see, well, how fast can someone run a controlled environment 100 miler? And that's what I really want to see. Uh, Cause I think I've gotten so much enjoyment from this sport. I mean, I've gotten so much enjoyment from the sport. I've been able to turn it into a career. And I think there's, there's other people who can do the same thing. And it's not necessarily going to come at the expense of my career. Uh, but it's going to bring more attention to the sport. It's going to bring more interest in the sport. It's going to open the sport up to people who maybe otherwise would have never thought about it, seen it, considered it. And to me, I think that's like a much more rewarding goal mm -hmm. than saying, I want to break this record and I want to hold it for decades or I want to die with this record so I never have to see someone go faster than me. <laughs> well, that's the progress of human civilization. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we keep creating cool stuff. <laughs> well, and it's it's the other thing is just like, if you're honest with yourself too, it's, uh, I mean, we're seeing this right now in the running world where, you know, new innovations come in, new technologies come in, new nutritional approaches come in. And then we see like the new crop of folks have advantages that the old crop didn't have. And it can be easy to look back on that and say like, hey, well, um, you know, if I would have had that product or if I would have done that, I would have run this. But then you're getting into that negative, you know, thought process again, which I generally try to stay out of. <laughs> I think uh, there's kind of a couple directions to look at it through or lenses to look at it through. There's like the in the moment, right? There's always going to be that run where uh, you're clicking along and things just feel great. You get some endorphins and you get the, the, you know, the, the quote unquote runners high and that sort of stuff. And that's like, just like this great feeling that you can kind of tap into on the, like the real, like, like in the moment type of level. Uh, you know, you've, uh, my wife and I talk about this cause she's a competitive ultra runner as well. And, um, 
you, you you'll we'll have a day where you know we'll take a forced day off or something like that and it's necessary right it's gonna allow the enjoyment to continue but you get into this like routine of I wake up in the morning, I do this run and that kind of gets my day started. That gets my my energies up. I get that runner's high afterwards. You remove that from the equation for a rest day and you just sort of like, oh man, I don't I feel like I never <laughs> got started today. Like, yeah. you know, it's just this weird thing. It's almost, it, I think it's, it's funny because non-runners don't always like necessarily recognize it because for them it's the complete opposite they're mm-hmm. like if i can get away from not having to run today that's gonna be a good day versus <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's one of those things that i think gets more addictive the more you do it so uh yes and i think that's one of the drivers from just a quality of life standpoint uh just uh you know an in the moment immediate gratification uh standpoint but then there's like i think the bigger picture stuff or the longer term stuff and for me, that enjoyment is like just the process like of, uh, okay, I'm starting at this fitness level and I'm going to do these workouts. And by doing these workouts, I'm going to see incremental progress from them. And then that's another kind of like kind of short-term gratification that's maybe a little longer than the day-to-day, but um, still like shorter than like a career or a, or a buildup for a particular race where you're saying, you're seeing yourself like, okay, maybe I'm focusing on short intervals right now. And on week one, I covered this much distance in three minutes, but by week four, I'm covering this much distance. And you can just see that progress. Mm-hmm. It's almost like uh, in elementary school when you get the gold star for reading a book, it's like, did that gold star really mean anything? I don't know, but I felt great when they gave it to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's something about just finding improvement. I mean, people love to see improvement, I think. So that's where uh, I think you can also get some value in it saying like, I started here and I got there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think there's also just like uh, what I would call this maybe more the cherry on top, which is like where you express your work, which is the race itself, where that's going to be kind of the thing that kind of like uh, shows up on the end result and where it kind of identifies whether you did things right or wrong. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really cool, cool way to look at it. And I think it's when you really open up the perspective of that too, it's like, even uh, obviously, you know, having a great day, like winning the tournament or, you know, getting further than you were expected yeah. to or beating someone who you've never beaten before or something like that, uh, or in the running perspective, like achieving that goal time, uh, that sort of stuff. Obviously, those are kind of like the ones you, you if, when you're honest with yourself, you really want and you're going to probably get the most satisfaction out of. But even when they don't go wrong, like maybe like with your grappling tournament uh, analogy, the you know, maybe the guy you're grappling against does a move on you and you're like, I was not prepared for that move. Yeah. So now the enjoyment becomes, okay, back to the drawing board. Yeah. Now I need to find out what do I do when that happens to me next time? Yeah. And that's where the, the I think the why comes in again. Right. Same thing with running. Like maybe I make a mistake and, you know, like I <laughs> eat something I didn't really want to eat or, or thought was going to work, but didn't work. And it costs me more time than I gained by having it or something like that. And then I go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, I can't do that. That didn't work. Or if I'm going to do that, I need to be more prepared to be able to do it. And I love that part of the sport. Um, Just Just the rearranging of things and adjusting (laughs) and tinkering. It's a lost opportunity too. Like if, uh, I mean, like when I look at even uh, my hundred mile race of 1119, I can find spots in there where I was like, ah, oh, you know what? I could clean that up a little bit. Maybe if I do this differently. And I mean, that's going to get me, you know, a little bit faster. If I sat back and said, hey, well, things went great that day. Cool. Let's see if we can replicate it. Then, you know, I'd probably run 1119 again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, the, if we were looking at it from like a philosophical level or like an approach level, I think there's some things that carry over from regardless of the distance. Mm -hmm. So I think working on your weaknesses and things that are least specific to what you're going to do on race day, but are still going to be important things in terms of improving your ability to perform on race day or maximizing your potential, uh, with the things that are specific you do first. Mm-hmm. I say that, but <laughs> the, the, there's a caveat with endurance sport. And I think maybe even more specifically with things like our ultra marathons or hundred milers where you want a really strong aerobic foundation or like a base before you really start, I think, structuring things towards a specific one. 
So for me, I think like a target for me is oftentimes like, uh, you know, getting really fit at like what my pace would be at, like my aerobic threshold or what a lot of people maybe call like a maximum aerobic function. Um, I mean, the running world is kind of weird where we have like these terminologies where there's sometimes multiple words that essentially mean the same thing, but one is from like a, just an, an actual physiological reaction and one is just like a feeling and stuff like that. So that would depend on the event, I would say to a degree. And, and there's contra like conflicting ideas about like kind of how to structure it. I think a lot of times like uh, you do want to like time on feet in most cases is just going to be like I'm running easy, whatever feels easy that day. And that can be different from one day to the next. Like I might feel great and, you know, that produces a much faster pace than if I, you know, feel really miserable or something like that. Um, so that's why I think a lot of times running, well, they'll, they'll do the they'll, they'll whole perceived, perceived effort or perceived mm -hmm. exertion. And they're, you're, you're looking at kind of understanding the response your body has to a certain effort level. And you're supposed to target a certain effort level in order to like get a certain response. So to maybe simplify that a little bit or make it a little clearer, like, I think I focus on essentially like short intervals. I focus on longer intervals or tempo runs. Uh, I focus on um, like race pace intensity, which is a lot of times what I'll build my long run around. Um, but I'll also like, those are kind of like the small pieces to the puzzle. Those are the options you're working with. Yeah, but I'm going to always try to work with those options on top of a massive aerobic base, which is going to probably be like 80% of the work. So how do you build that massive aerobic base? What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Just distance? Distance and essentially, so I like to call it micro stressing because you're going to always start at a different spot depending on where your fitness level's at and depending on where you're at as an individual. I'm going to be targeting my aerobic threshold. I'm going to get right up to it, but not necessarily cross over it. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's been popularized with maximum aerobic function as kind of a training philosophy. That philosophy in itself, I think maybe is a little more like holistic where they're saying, do this basically all the time. And by doing so, you're going to like, you're going to raise your aerobic potential by so much that, you know, you can kind of like race yourself into shape at that point. And this would be maybe more specific for like shorter distance or endurance runs where you're not going to really race yourself in the shape with hundred milers. But for 5Ks, you might, you might do like a huge base building phase where you're going up to that maximum aerobic function or that aerobic threshold and you're watching your pace come down at that. So the rule there is basically like if you're seeing improvement, that's the sign you're looking for or which would just be your pace dropping at that heart rate or at that intensity. And uh, if you're seeing that continually go down, you're heading in the right direction. If you start seeing it go the opposite way, you're you're probably overreaching where you're trying to do too much of it. So that's kind of dictates how much, the, do the dose, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah. And then that's where it gets a little tricky because like unless you go into a lab and get your aerobic threshold tested, it's really hard to have like an exact number on it. Um, you know, Dr. Phil Maffetone with the maximum function process, he'll say 180 minus your age is going to give you your. And here's the advantage of that. I think like with any of these things, you want to look at it through where are the advantages here and I need to account for those. And then where are the potential disadvantages mm -hmm. and then decide for me as an individual, do these advantages outweigh the disadvantages and what's the alternative approach and is that going to produce more advantages or less? So with, with maximum aerobic function, uh, here's some advantages. Like it is low enough intensity where you can train pretty consistently at a fairly high volume with a very low injury risk, with uh, very low like things that are going to maybe lower your quality of life, like muscle damage and things like that. Um, it's a more efficient way in the sense that you're going to be like prioritizing like fat metabolization, which, um, I mean, if you're looking at like Jeff Volick and or Dr. Jeff Volick and Dr. Dominic Diagostino, some of their research and things like that, like they're going to show that, you know, that's going to be a little cleaner way to go about things from just a recovery standpoint, a breakdown standpoint. I think the MAF 180 formula is about as good of a, formula as you're going to find in terms of capturing as many people as you can get away with capturing with a kind of a universal thing. Uh, like any of these things, I mean, it's, it's more likely kind of on a bell curve where like the bulk of that 180 minus their age is probably going to be a pretty good, at least starting point to kind of figure out where that is. There's some other things you can like maybe use to kind of check it that I like to do. 
if I'm, let's say I just, I did 180 minus my age and I went out and I started running and it was like, I'm running along and I'm just like, my, my breathing is labored. I'm, you know, I'm struggling to get a sentence out without gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my body telling me I'm probably not actually at my true like math number or my true, like underneath mm -hmm. my true aerobic threshold, like aerobic threshold and maximum aerobic function. You should be able to do that for hours and you should be able to breathe pretty efficiently and talk. Yep. Carry a conversation. Um, other people will say like you, another way to kind of gauge it, if you can breathe in your nose and out your mouth, that's not necessarily the best way to do on a, from a performance standpoint, but it can be a good kind of governor that will allow you to like, if you can, if you can no longer breathe in your nose and out your mouth, you're probably going too fast to actually technically be at your math pace or under your math pace. <laughs> there's, there's two ways to look at that, I think. And I think you're, you're, you're right on. I think that what, that what the advice from that, from that kind of a process would say is either you you're doing too much of it so it's getting too hard for where your skeletal muscle system is currently at mm -hmm. for that particular activity so like i mean it can be different too like if you're cycling versus running you know that's a, a little bit of a different mechanic where it can be different where you could take a super fit cyclist and then put them on, you know, the, the amount of volume they're going to be able to tolerate relative to what you're going to do when you remove like impact forces and things like that is going to be lower if they haven't been practicing that activity. So for you, like, you know, you're prioritizing like uh, 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 wrestling and mixed martial arts or not mixed martial arts, but jujitsu type stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, running is maybe kind of that that uh, that secondary activity versus the primary activity. But yeah, so what they would say is probably like maybe instead of doing that, at, let's say you were doing that for like 30 miles a week or something like that, and it was getting too hard to continue, They're, they'd say, you know, come back to 20, get used to 20, get comfortable with 20, then let's get you up to 25 and 30 and kind of just like inch you along. Well, and it also, it simplifies it so much that you're forced to, right? You're forced <laughs> to optimize within that real strict parameter versus am I doing my short intervals right, but my long runs wrong? Or am I doing my like long intervals right, but my short intervals? Wrong? And then you just, it kind of complicates things when you start throwing a lot of stuff there. And for most people, especially when they're first getting started, you know, you're, you can't overcomplicate it or you're just going to like, you're going to do like a bunch of half right, half wrong things and then not really know where your progress or your deficits are necessarily at. So uh, I do think this is an amazing approach, especially for people who are just getting into it and building that that foundation. Um, where where I think maybe you want to deviate from that a little bit, especially when you start to get into these events that are operating well outside that intensity. So you take something like, um, you know, let's say it's a race that takes you in the neighborhood of around like twelve minutes or something like that. Then you're going to be running significantly faster than your your maximum aerobic function pace. So most of the research is going to say at some point in time, you need to get around to practicing the pace at which you're going to perform at and really fine tuning the mechanics, uh, the efficiencies, uh, how it feels, how to judge it, how to pace it at the pace you're going to try to compete at. So there's obviously like a large range of targets there when we're talking about the endurance world in general, where, you know, you have these shorter events like five kilometers, and then you also have hundred mile races, which are going to typically be quite a bit below your maximum aerobic function in, especially on these trail races. I actually think that's that's where you want to get to. The problem uh, is most people have a hard time getting to that because they'll go out and they'll run with a friend and match their pace or they'll go out and they'll say, well, I want to run this pace. So they'll target that pace or target a specific heart rate, which is you know not necessarily how they maybe feel good doing it. Right. So I think like once you, I mean, obviously I think when you put a race on the calendar, if your goal is performance, it's a little harder to just say like, well, I'm going to run whatever feels good today because right. eventually you have to get yes. around to doing what's specific. But from just a fitness standpoint, health standpoint, enjoyment standpoint, um, it, I think it's totally fine to go out and say, I'm going to run what feels good today. And, you know, maybe someday you will feel like at the end of the run, I'm going to do a couple sprints just to get some, you know, that because it does, that one's a hard one to kind of jumpstart. But once you do it and you realize how kind of good it feels, maybe to throw in a few accelerations at the end of a run and then you you... You say, oh, wow, that feels pretty good to do that. I feel a little more That's accomplished. Right. Well, I think too with with feel running and what I mean by that is that's kind of back to that perceived effort thing where like yeah. you do enough of it and you start being able to recognize, exactly. like I can go out and if you said, okay, run, you know, 60 minutes at your aerobic threshold, I could go 
I could know where that is on my heart rate. And I could go out there and just say like, okay, I know what that feels like and go out and run that feel. And I'm going to hit that spot. Like, I, I bet you if we looked at my heart rate data after, it'd be right in there. And I mm-hmm. wouldn't have to look. And some of that's just experience. Yeah. Some of it's just understanding, like, when, like, no, noticing the physiological responses when you cross over versus step a little bit too below it. Uh, you can catch yourself daydreaming and forget. I'll do this sometimes, too, where I'll be tired. Because I'm kind of like you, too, where when I'm getting really fit, uh, especially with my foundation, like, I got to, you know, I'm moving pretty quick at my aerobic threshold. So, like, if I start daydreaming too much, I can notice, oh, I'm drifting back a little bit. I look down at my heart rate, my, oh, yeah, I'm 10 beats under. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you do, it, it does take a little bit of, I think, just uh, awareness. Um, but it, it's also not necessarily something where you have to be so exact that you're hitting, ex- you know, an exact heart rate all the time. There's usually a range. And there's even, like, some fluctuations where, like, if you've been healthy for a year or two, without any injuries and you've been fit that you can probably add five beats to your maximum aerobic function if you're using that as kind of your your target from the 180 minus your age formula. The ready-made plans, I definitely follow like a philosophy um, and it's going to be like kind of like lockstep in that. Um, so for those, like there's just always going to be a sacrifice when you do like a ready-made plan because there's you're removing the individual context there. So for folks who are like really want to get into the weeds, I usually do like a personalized coaching plan with them where we sit down and we actually look at their strengths, their weaknesses, and really kind of go in from that perspective and fine tune it. And it also like, it avoids a situation where, oh, my ready-made plan says I'm supposed to do this run today, but I don't feel great today. So what do I do? I mean, some people are fine with that because they're 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 aware enough of like the process that they can adjust it themselves other folks just need a little more support so Mm -hmm. um that's kind of the difference there but in terms of the structure of it it kind of goes with uh, an approach where we're saying you build this foundation you're going to spend you know usually anywhere between eight to 12 weeks just building up your your aerobic foundation you're going to be doing a lot of stuff that are kind of at i call them base runs uh, but they're basically your maximum aerobic function or your up to your aerobic threshold type stuff and they're really going to get really fit with that. And once they kind of have that foundation laid, then it's time to get into the specifics of whatever distance they're doing. So if it, where it will differ will be like if they're doing – right now on those plans, I think I've got 5K, half marathon, marathon, 50K, 80 to 100K, and then 100 miles. So if they pick a 5K plan, the order of operations is going to be different than if they pick the 100-mile plan. You're going to see some of the same workouts show up in that plan. It's just going to be different areas of it. Mm-hmm. So once they're really fit – at that, uh, you know, that foundational level, then, you know, if they're doing say a hundred mile plan, they might start doing some short intervals, which I would, on my plans, I usually range between 30 seconds up to four minutes. It's kind of that short interval range. And can you describe what you mean by short interval? It's, it's like a sprint and then a rest. What's yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll use basically like, I'll use like a, basically a 12 minute time trial. And that's going to kind of like dictate for them what the intensity and the pace is going to be for some of those. When they're under a minute, they'll push past that a little bit. Um, but usually when we're up to like above a minute and certainly up to four minutes, the, like whatever pace or intensity that they get for that kind of 12 minute time trial, where they're just seeing how far they can go in 12 minutes is going to be um, kind of like about where they're going to target for those intervals. So then those intervals are going to be structured. Let's say they're doing two minute intervals. They're going to do two minutes at that intensity that they could do for 12 minutes at a time trial. Then they're going to do a two minute real easy jog or maybe even walk just to kind of bounce back. And they're going to repeat. Yeah, there's some newer formulas that are probably a little less uh, um, brutal (laughs) Uh, where you kind of, uh, I haven't really dove into these that, that in depth yet. I know like um, that you can kind of replicate it by doing like a short, a very short interval and then a slightly longer one. Um, and then like another one where like at the end one, that last one will kind of indicate what it is. Uh, and so you're doing less of it to get the same answer to the question. But sometimes I think when it's someone who's new, I'd rather them just do a 12 minute time trial because it's easy for them to execute in the sense that it's pretty clear. You do a warm up, you do some strides, maybe some dynamic stretches, and you just run as hard as you can for 12 minutes, as evenly paced as you can manage. And, uh, I mean, if the, if, it's just going to produce the data I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it's just also no like, matter what happens, it'll produce the data. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can you can screw it up. I guess you can go way too fast, and then you have this scenario where, like, oh, it looks like your you know your first two minutes were drastically faster than your last two, and then it's like oh, we we maybe screwed that one up. But 
Um, but I mean, really, like you don't even need to do the time trial technically. Um, a lot of times you can go off of feel like what we described with um, the threshold stuff. And, and you know, it's a high enough intensity where, where like you can start to kind of like your, your body is going to kind of limit you to a degree where um, if I said we didn't do the time trial and just started doing the intervals, we could figure out that, you know, if they're doing them right or not, if we see a scenario where, oh, it looks like these first two intervals were significantly slower than the last two, chances are we're still not quite dialed in in terms of what the intensity is that you should be targeting for those. And as you do a few of them, you just get to know the pacing of it a little better. And then you start seeing more even splits. So like, you know, their first two minute intervals pretty close within a couple seconds of their second, or, you know, I guess we'd be looking at distance if we're doing time. So like you went approximately the same distance on that last one as you did the first one. And then we're just looking for improvement over time. So, you know, we might spend four, six weeks kind of focusing on improving that. We're going to still include kind of foundational running volume where you're going to be running like an easy pace and enjoyable pace kind of in the interim. And then there's going to be some rest days. And that's going to be where the levels come in. My like level one plans are going to be like four day a week training plans. Level two are going to be five day. Level three are going to be six day with one day off. Um, and you can obviously operate outside of those. Those those are just the ones that I put up for the ready made when I'm coaching people kind of personalized. We just, we look at like what their history is with running, their schedule, all sorts of stuff. Because oftentimes people get hung up on like, well, what are the elites doing? What are the professionals doing? What are the Olympians doing? It's like, well... It's like what the Olympians are doing is they're waking up and they're living and breathing everything around this one race that they're going to do in four years. Or <laughs> So it's like we need to step away from that if you're working, you know, 10 hours a day and you got kids and all this other stuff too. So um, there's a lot of variables that make it more interesting to coach someone who's actually like not an elite athlete or someone who's a professional athlete, I should say. Uh, the But but yeah, so they're, they're going to do that stuff, those, those shorter intervals. Um, for probably about like four to six weeks. If they're doing, if they're doing a longer race, like a hundred miles, if they were doing say a 5k, we'd start bringing those workouts in near the end of their plan. Cause that's going to be specific to their race pace. Mm. That's going to be the intensity that maybe they're doing for, you know, like a 3k or a 5k or something like that. So it's just going to be more relative to what they're going to use. So it follows that philosophy. The plans follow that philosophy of weaknesses and least specific stuff early. And then we start phasing closer to most specific stuff and strengths as you get kind of near to the end of the plan. And and then the, the distance of, or the time that you're going to spend out doing whatever event it is, is going to dictate how those kind of get ordered in there. With those parameters, I think like you actually probably would be a great candidate for a maximum heroic function training strategy. Like you want that consistency where I'm going to do the same thing each day. Uh, you don't want to beat yourself up so much any one day that you can't get out and do it the next one. That's the sweet spot with maximum aerobic function is the, the, the trademark there is that you, you can keep going and keep doing it again and again and again, because as long as you're not, you know, going out one day and trying to do twice as much as what you're ready for, for that one. So the key for you is going to be picking the right starting point and then building from there on what that day kind of entails in terms of how much running you do. So, um, where you could maybe get creative would be if you decided that it's a hard, fast rule that you run an hour every day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. but we find out that to run your maximum aerobic function means you probably are better off sticking to 30 minutes. Then what you would maybe do is you would run underneath your maximum aerobic function for the first 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes, maybe throw some of those strides in there. If you want to do that at the very end. Uh, and then that middle 30 minutes is going to be maximum aerobic function target. Got it. And then maybe after, you know, four weeks, you start noticing, you know what? This 30 minutes isn't wearing me out near as much as it used to. Um, I feel like I could easily push past that. Well, let's up that to 40 minutes of that 60. You're always staying within that 60-minute parameter that keeps your your schedule consistent, your routine consistent. I'm wearing a heart rate monitor to sort of mo as I run to monitor it. Sure, actively. yeah. You could do that. You could go perceived effort. Um, I like to use them in tandem in the sense that like early on, I'll maybe look at my heart rate a little more often, uh, especially for shorter length. There is heart rate can get messy the longer you go. So I, I end up kind of maybe stepping away from heart rate a little more than some will at a certain point because I'm ultimately I'm going to be 
usually training or working with someone to run like, you know, a race that's really long and they have cardiac drift, dehydration, heat, and things that are gonna it make the heart rate super messy. Yeah, but you're probably, your ability to measure perceived effort is exceptionally good. Mine is actually really weak. Okay, I don't, heart rate then. I need to do the, still the work of connecting heart rate to mm -hmm. the perceived effort. Yep, and that's exactly what I would use heart rate for then. And you'll get to a point probably by like in the first couple of months where you you can still lean on heart rate if you want, but it'll be kind of one of those things where you you keep looking at it, you're like, oh, wow, I can mm -hmm. guess it. And you play a game with yourself too. And you say like, well, how close can I guess? <laughs> yeah. You'll get it. So like for That's me, cool. what I'll That's do is cool I'll, go, I'll do the run and then I'll look at the heart rate afterwards and be like, oh, cool, I was right there. Yeah. Or I remember feeling like I was speeding up a little bit there and there are shows right there That's on the right heart there. rate. Or <laughs> Yeah, and I think like you're going to get from, if we're not looking at it from like specifically like training a, a pace in order to get both the skeletal muscle adaptations as well as the cardiovascular benefits, you're probably tapping into some of the higher intensity stuff with that body weight stuff. This, and unless you're doing, I guess. No rest. It's okay, very quick. so is it, it you get pretty high heart rate from that? Yeah, yeah, very hard. Okay. So higher yeah. than running, yep. So you're checking that box there from just like a lifestyle uh, enjoyment, fitness, overall fitness standpoint. Uh, I think you want to keep your running more aerobic then because you're getting that and you're probably getting it from like your grappling workouts too, I would guess. So there's just not as big of a need for you from a big picture standpoint to be doubling down on that stuff with your runs as well. And, and it sounds like you prefer not to. <laughs> The big difference is going to be like you're dropping intensity significantly by going up to 100 miles versus the marathon. So the maximum aerobic function, I think, is actually going to feed into that maybe a little bit better. It's probably going to be a little closer um, depending on where. I mean, it all it all varies a bit because like people, people will focus on specific distances and they'll get very efficient and very adapted to that. So like the it kind of like it's what makes running kind of messy where like you'll get for, for example, like the average person can hit their like lactate threshold for probably about like 60 minutes or something like that. Whereas you get these elite marathoners who've been basically spending their entire life preparing for a marathon race. They can push almost up to their lactate threshold and at their lactate threshold for almost like two hours. So mm -hmm. it gets a little messy when you start um, looking at it from that lens, but you're, you don't really have to worry about that too much because you're not really focusing on being the best possible hundred miler or the best possible marathoner you could be. You want enough overall fitness that you can just do either one of them yeah. without absolute misery because you did the couch to hundred miles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think like for, for hundred miles, the biggest difference, I think given your context is just like the more physical things you are doing, the better prepared you're going to be for the hundred mm -hmm. mile. So it's almost given your context, I, I wouldn't say irrelevant, you wanna be doing running, but you're gonna be doing that once you put it in your program, it sounds like it's gonna be pretty locked in. Um, you're gonna to wanna to also, like, like it, it, if you view it this way, it's probably gonna be more mentally beneficial too, where, hey, today I did my run, I did my body weight exercises, I did some grappling practice, you know, I spent three hours working out today. Yeah. If you think of it like that, then, you know, you're you're moving your body, you're doing things that are active for a good chunk of the day, especially relative to most people. So that's going to actually be very helpful for you. Uh, the the problem or the, the, the battle to get over is going to just be like the, you know, you're going to break down physically running 100 miles and you're going to break down physically running a marathon too. So like the, you might just have to push through a little more discomfort, like from a physical standpoint, compared to be if you decided I'm gonna do everything I can in these next like 24 weeks to be able to run a, a, a full hundred of a hundred miler. Yeah, what I would do with that is I would try to make the unpleasant thing be different from one day to the next, right. if you can. So the fear. I would have with making running unpleasant every time would be it becomes like a negative feedback loop right. in your physiologically potentially as well as mentally where if the entire running process is miserable, 
you're going to be miserable when you step on that starting line, whether it's a marathon or a hundred miles. So <laughs> you've trained yourself that uh -huh. running equals miserable. Well, and here's the thing. Like, I mean, if you look at just like, here's where the literature says on paper are like the, you know, dozen workouts you should do in a training plan. And this is how you should structure them right down to the minute. And you just say like, I'm going to give everyone this schedule and they're going to do this every time, rinse and repeat. My biggest concern with that approach is you are potentially putting them in a position where the training is so boring and so monotonous yeah. that like if they hit a roadblock mentally, they're going to fall apart very quick because they've already exhausted themselves mentally just trying to do the same old interval every time, doing the same old, you know, workout. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like one specific plan in its entirety. It could just be like, like the the mix of things within it so like rather than like if i just said oh well, we're going to do three minute intervals through this entire short interval process or two minute intervals or four minute intervals or 60 second intervals you know by that sixth week they might be so sick of that that they're not actually maximizing their potential within that because there's no flavor there and and then they're also actually getting less out of themselves than they would if we just got a little more creative and said okay let's mix this up and let's do uh you know four one minute intervals then take a, like a little bit of a break and then we'll do three minute intervals or at least changing it up from week to week so that they have something different showing up, even though we're addressing the same kind of physiological adaptation. Uh, so like, I think what you want to do is you want to introduce the misery. You want to be able to test yourself to the degree where like when you can recognize these points of, I don't want to be here, but I can do it and push through it. But recognize that like, there's not necessarily going to be one event that you want to lean on to get that from because you won't want to make that one event so miserable that you don't want to do it when it comes time for the challenge. So if you can possibly say like, okay, on Tuesdays, the push-up workout, I'm going to go 10 push-ups more than I want to. I'm going to get to that point where I'm like, mm -hmm. there's no more. And then I'm going to do 10 more and you're going to make that one miserable. And then maybe on, uh, you know, Thursdays, you decide to do like some of those sprints or something at the end where- yeah you do a few of them and you're like, okay, I, this is where I'd be comfortable to stop. Like, well, I'm going to do two more of them because I know I don't want to do two more of them, mm -hmm. but mix that up. So you're not, so at least you're getting enjoyment from some of it and not just getting complete disgust from the entire project. Yeah. And I think like where a lot of times things get confusing for people here is the context of it too, where it's like, they want an answer as to what do I eat? for endurance sport. And it's like, well, endurance sport is quite wide ranging as we've yeah. talked about many, many times here. So there's gonna be differences, I think, in just like what you wanna maybe necessarily prioritize uh, both for the event you're doing and the intensity that's required for it, the training that's required for that event. And then also the individual component too, where I think this one often gets overlooked, where we tend to say like, well, we've got all these Olympic medalists at the marathon and below distance who are, you know, eating a moderate to high carbohydrate diet. So everyone needs to do that if they want to reach their potential in, you know, say the 3K to the marathon. And, you know, in a perfect world, maybe that would be true, but there's a lot of other variables that often get forgotten then that could positively or negatively impact that decision choice. So I think uh, Dr. Jeff Volk has done a great job of kind of highlighting this in the sense that, you know, when he works with people, he works with people in the health sphere as well as the performance sphere. And, you know, he's one of the main guys at Verta Health who's, uh, they've got like a 60% uh, success rate with working with folks with uh, type 2 diabetes to um, reverse their type 2 diabetes. Uh, and I mean, that's an astounding, when you, th when you think of just any nutritional protocol, it's success rate, they're all incredibly low. They're very, very low. And the big difference with his is the coaching aspect of it. Like they give support. So these people like have someone to turn to when they make a mistake or if they're thinking about doing something differently or they don't know what to do rather than just kind of throwing throwing it all up in the air and quitting, they, they, they have a resource there. And that's probably a big reason why that's the success rate that they have with that is they put those support mechanisms in place. That picture needs to be carried into the performance world or the running world too, where, you know, we may have just been identifying that, uh, you know, Olympic distance athletes that can tolerate a very large portion of their diet coming from carbohydrate is going to just, it's going to filter those ones towards the Olympics, <laughs> filter those towards Interesting. the event. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that like, uh, if we would have taken 
say the gold medals in the 5k and put them on a low carb diet, they'd run faster. They probably wouldn't because we may have already selected that that person's thriving on carbohydrate. Mm. Uh, what I would be interested in is like you have, let, let's say we have someone with equal talent, but got weeded out along the way potentially because for whatever reason, they just weren't able to tolerate like the, both the training and the nutrition requirements that they're being told to do. I mean, I might be an example of this actually, where, you know, you take someone where, uh, they, for whatever reason, the carbs aren't working for them. Like it's unsustainable for them to continue that path. Or if they do, they might have a shortened career. So they might be able to eke out a few really good years, but then, you know, they're not going to be the person they're like, wow, that person's 38 and they're still competing at the Olympics type of a person. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you, you, you put them on a low carb diet. Uh, if you can control everything else, like their entire lifestyle is based around training and racing, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, they may still have better potential by introducing carbohydrates at a higher level. But if that's not going to, if that's not going to be sustainable for them as a person, then, you know, what's the point kind of at that, unless they want to be like a kind of a, a spark in the pan, so to speak. Yeah, I think, uh, so for, for some context, like I followed what I would call a low carbohydrate diet for the last 10 years. And just like kind of the training, I periodize it to a degree where there are parts of my training where I do bring back a little more carbohydrate. And there's periods of my training, especially like the off season where I'm like very low and I might be like kind of in that ballpark of uh, like, you know, ketogenic, strict ketogenic or no carbohydrates for, for periods of time. And what uh, kind of food are we talking about? What's, um, a, what's a strict low carb diet? I've ranged everywhere from like mostly plant-based low carb keto to like mostly animal-based. I very rarely gone much more than like two weeks strict where it's like I'm strict carnivore or strict plant-based or anything like that. Like we're talking probably more like 95% at the, at the peak um, in terms of any type of like, like longer lasting uh, from my personal experience of like being like either in like the animal food camp or like the plant-based camp kind of a, of a process. Um, so I've tried all of them. Things that stayed consistent over the 10 years is a kind of the macronutrient profile that I've done throughout the course of- So one didn't win over the other in terms of meat-based versus plant-based? Oh, for me, meat-based definitely. What was, I mean, I was I was my highest meat consumption in 2019 and that was by far my best racing season. Yeah, we keep, we keep coming back to that year. That was a good year for many reasons, <laughs> philosophically and nutritionally. Yeah, well, 2020 happened and now I haven't had a really good chance to- <laughs> To, to, uh, to improve, it. yeah. <laughs> we'll see, hopefully yeah. I've got some more, yeah. <laughs> some more in the tank. I think it's maybe less about the meat and it's more about like, what are you, what is it replacing? So if we go, if we step away from like me specifically and just like the people that, cause I mean, we're getting to the point where I get it's anecdotes, but like, like that's what we have at the moment. Cause there's, I mean, there is a, actually a study being done on like, I think, I guess they'd call it hyper carnivore where they're like, I think above 80% of their intake from meat. Into meat. Um, and they're looking at a few different things there, but. It's the individual thing, right? Yeah, like, it's the individual I mean, there's, thing. I, there's countless people now who like, and, and I'm not saying that they could not have found another route, myself included. Like in 2011, when I switched from moderate to high carbohydrate to low carbohydrate and saw some very noticeable differences in the way I felt, the way I performed and all this stuff, that doesn't mean that there wasn't another path. I just did not find that path. And the, the, the fact that I found a path that was producing the results I was looking for is really all that matters in my mind. You know, like I don't really care if there was a parallel path that works just as well or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Because ultimately we only have one shot at everything yeah. we're doing. So like, it'd be, it'd be great if I could go back and try four or five different things. Well, the annoying thing is that the, the body adjusts to whatever the heck you're doing. So mm -hmm. you can't, it's hard to do good science even on yourself. Yeah, I've referenced my 2019 racing season a few times and it's like, it'd be silly for me to put all of the emphasis on my nutrition plan for that because it's also comes with two decades of endurance training. So mm -hmm. it's possible and it's very likely that a huge portion of that success was just the culmination of a lot of work over time from the training side of things. I just think like anytime you hyper-focus on one area or pick a couple variables and just target those, you find yourself in a position where you are, you're putting other things in the most uncharitable light possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so then you have this situation where like, 
it's actually a combination of a variety of different things. So where are the big movers? And, you know, for me, nutritional shift was pretty clear that that improved my sleep and my recovery. And I mean, people can say, well, there's the placebo effect, which is a very real concern. But, you know, for me personally, a 10 year placebo effect would be a quite lengthy placebo effect. Um, and <laughs> I do think it's individual though. I, I, I emphasize that a lot because I mean, I've worked with tons of people with this and I do see a range from person to person. I've worked with people who come to me and they're like strict keto and we raise up their carbohydrates a bit and they're like, okay, I feel way better doing it this way. And I've worked with people who they come to me, moderate carbohydrate, but they're interested enough. Um, they, they want to try a lower carb. So we, you know, we titrate them down and I've had clients where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna give them this workout and they're gonna wish they brought back a little bit of carbohydrate and then they go and they nail the workout and I'm just like baffled that because, <laughs> yeah. because they're different from me. And I, every time, you know, when you have your own personal experience, the first the kind of guttural response is, oh, if I had done it, it would have gone this way. Why did it go the complete opposite way for them? And you kind of have to just kind of step out of your own perspective a bit and say like, okay, well, they're different, you know, for whatever reason, they're getting, getting along like this. <laughs> Well, the nutrition community is probably like, we just got done like dealing with the vegans. Now we got this opposite end of <laughs> yes, the spectrum coming exactly. at us. But I think, well, I mean, what this all tells, <laughs> what this all tells me is like, there is, uh, for one, like in our food environment, like the failure rate of any one approach at a population level is going to be incredibly high. I mean, it's why we have, you know, what is it like 88% of the population has some sort of like metabolic syndrome. And it's, it's like, you know, it's because there's an endless quantity of everything that you can get your hands on for relatively cheap. Um, and I think that's that that presents a problem if your mindset is going to be, we need this set of parameters for nutrition and everyone needs to adhere to that or you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, tell that to the person who like went carnivore and cleared up some like crazy skin ailment or something yeah, like that. That's or, a Mental one, I think may, I'm, I'm stepping out a bit on a limb here, but I, I want to say like some of the research of uh, Dominic D'Agostino and, and Jeff Volick was looking at the ketogenic diet, which a carnivore diet is basically going to be a part of a ketogenic. I mean, you could always go like way too high on the protein, I guess, mm. but most people that I see doing carnivore, they're cognizant enough that at least if they're doing it for therapeutic reasons, they're not going like you know, 50% protein, 50 minutes. They're more like 70, 30, 80, 20, something like that. And, and I think like you, you do see some, some work with like the brain and so the mental stuff. I know some of the, I, I'm not sure if this was part of the DARPA funding that, that Dr. De, Dominic D'Agostino had, where they were looking at things like mental stuff, like post-traumatic stress disorder and that sort of stuff with, with like a strict ketogenic diet. So I wonder if some of that, hmm like the depression related stuff has to do with that where now like their body is just fueling their brain differently than maybe they were in the past. But um, that's just, you know, wild guesses on my part. <laughs> um, and I'm deviating from the conversation, but like. <laughs> okay. It'll be a little different for racing than it will be for like a big workout just because the interesting thing about ultra running is just like you never do the race even like most endurance races you're going to cover the distance you're going to replicate the race almost up to it in training whereas with 100 miles you, you can't <laughs> you might replicate a third of it yes. so so i'll do i'll walk you through kind of my approach for a, for like a 100 mile race mm -hmm. and i can tell you maybe what i would do differently on like a training day uh but yeah so for um where where the community is in agreement is that you do want to be very good at burning fat for ultra marathons. I mean, there's just like the intensity is low. If your if your ratios are skewed very high towards you know, carbohydrate metabolism, then you're gonna have to defend your muscle glycogen through tons of carbohydrate consumption, and and that's just gonna be very hard to do over the course of an entire day, even at low intensities. So it's a fuel tank thing. I mean, it's like your your leanest endurance athletes have way more fat than they do glycogen stores. Uh, when you're doing low intensity performance, you want to be burning high levels of fat and sparing that muscle glycogen. What I tend to do is I want to start the race burning really high levels of fat. So I'm going to, I'll maybe have some carbohydrate the night before for dinner, mm -hmm. but then I'm going to lean into the overnight fast breakfast the morning of, I'm going to stay away from carbohydrates for a hundred mile or anyway. 
and I'm going to have something like something that's pretty like uh, high energy, low volume. So like I'll do like an S Fuels uh, Life Bar. They've got like these. what's in an S Fuel Life Bar? Are we talking about carbs? Are we talking about protein? It's basically fat, fat and protein. It's fat like and a, protein. Yeah, fat protein bar, and they make some. That's carbs. awesome. Yeah, you need to get one. So it's it's not it's low carb. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they make S Fuels makes a whole product line that's like kind of positioned for a low carb athlete. So they have some products on their lineup that offer some carbohydrate, which is perfect for me because I do introduce some carbohydrate on racing and some of my bigger training sessions and things. But the majority of their products are low carb. Uh, so like they have like, you know how you get like the powders that you put into like your drinks that are like high carbohydrate, you know, sports products. They make a version of that that's uh, like fat based. Oh, cool. That um, you can mix in with, with water. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So they've got like a creamer version and then a fruity flavored version. So you can like replicate the taste and the feel of drinking like a, like, you know, a sports drink. Science <laughs> is awesome. I know it is. <laughs> well, and, it, and that's so much of it too. Cause people are always like, well, I don't know. I just, I, I just like to have my Gatorade or whatever. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, you can have it now. Just, uh, it won't have all and the you can, So you can bring that kind of thing with you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm leaning on a lot of those like kind of liquid calories, like those low um, volume, high energy, fat protein stuff the morning of, so that when I start the race, my body's gonna be encouraged to start out burning high levels of fat. Once I get going, probably about 45 minutes in, I'll start introducing small amounts of carbohydrate. So at that point, my body's been revving pretty high fat metabolism. And by introducing some carbohydrate w in the context of the, you know, let's say my 100 mile uh, personal record, you know, I'm, I'm running approximately nine miles every hour. So I'm probably going through about a thousand calories in an hour's time. Uh, I'm going to start just like s defending muscle glycogen by burning super high levels of fat at the heart rate. I would do for that. I'm probably burning somewhere between 80, 90% fat, you know, 12 hours of that. You can chip away at your muscle glycogen, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where you don't necessarily want to go zero carb. So I'm basically just trying to defend what I know I'm going to be burning from the carbohydrate side of that. 80 to 90% fat, 10 to 20% carbohydrate by taking in like, usually, you know, I've gone as low as about 15 grams of carbohydrate per hour and as high as 40 grams. And the reality is somewhere in between is probably the sweet spot, but 40, I can get away without any digestion issues. So I'm not really concerned pushing up to that during a race since I'm only concerned about performance on that day. Yeah, and I think uh, the funny thing is, like, if you look at the position paper for ultra marathon single day events, and it's, you know, it's very limited in the sense that, the, and it's not anyone's fault. It's just that we don't have a lot of great research on hundred mile races. It's really hard to study what's going on when someone's running hundred miles. But they will say a moderate carbohydrate diet is recommended. But they'll also say that it's like something like sixty percent of participants are going to report some sort of like digestion issue during mm -hmm. the event. So then it kind of becomes an issue of do you want to flip that coin? Do you want to yeah. flip that coin? It would be the 40%. Right, exactly. <laughs> so for me, what I found is like, I can push up to 40 grams without getting any digestion issues. Um, do I need 40 grams? Probably not, at least not based on kind of the numbers that would be like, uh, that that I would see on like, if I went and actually got a, like a metabolic heart test or something like that. Um, but it, it's possible. I mean, if I had a really good race that I would get close to burning that per hour. Um, most folks that are following a moderate high carbohydrate diet are going to be recommended to do like 50 to 70 grams during a single day ultra marathon event. And you'll see some, you know, some recommendations of up to like a hundred grams, uh, not so much for ultra marathons, but just in general from like a performance standpoint, which I mean, it's one of those things where it's like application versus like what you can do in a lab for one hour is going to be a lot different, especially when you're stretching out distances well past that. And you, you there's, there's. I'm diverting a little here, but I mean, there's like an approach of like training your gut so you can like mm -hmm. be able to tolerate that much carbohydrate, which you can do. And you may have to, if you're going to follow a high carbohydrate diet. But again, we go back to that practicality standpoint of if you're a professional Olympian who's living and breathing performance and you're burning two to three times your resting, <laughs> resting metabolic rate on some days, like you you may be able to to actually consume 100 grams of carbohydrate <laughs> per hour during your training sessions and, and and just you know barely stay on top of your nutritional needs 
most people who are running ultra marathons aren't going to be, you know, probably training much past 10 hours per week. Mm -hmm. And they're probably not going to have the, I'll call it their a dietary budget to tolerate 100 grams of carbohydrate consumption during their workouts and still be able to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I think that's kind of like a, a bit of a, of a non, a non-starter for the majority of people, unless we want to talk about like a tiny percentage of the 1% of top performers. Yeah, I think, I mean, I like to train on an empty stomach. Uh, I do most of my, my biggest training session usually in the morning and it usually what will determine whether I eat something or not before that is like, how much do I need to eat that day in order to stay on top of it to be able to train again the next day? Gotcha. So I'll, I'll, I'll usually do something similar to what I would do before a race if I need to kind of stay on top of calories for the day. So I'm not like at noon with like no calorie intake and like 5,000 calories to try to consume before I go to bed that night and get out and do the same thing the next day. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, in, in, if I were, if I were doing what you're doing, like if that were my lifestyle, I think I would do almost all my runs fasted. Uh, I don't see why I would be eating a lot before it because it's like, um, I'm just introducing something that could, that especially if you're noticing, like, here's what I'd say. If I was doing that and I was like, wow, this run sucks. And then I introduced something beforehand and now my run was feeling great and my progress was getting better that's when I would maybe consider having something before. But if you're running both of those, those like self experiments, you're noticing, yeah, if I eat something before I go in this workout, the workout's less enjoyable. I'm not noticing any, any increased improvements on it. Again, it's a little messy. Like we said before, it's hard to really, you can't go back and try it a different way on that specific day. But I think, I think most people, if they're just like, if they go at it with like no bias in the sense that they're like trying to make one work versus the other you can get a, at least a good enough look at it. And if absolute peak performance in one activity, one very specific activity isn't your goal, then it's like, do you really care if one X has a 2% performance increase yeah. that you won't even probably notice? Cause there's other variables that will clearly overpower that 2% one way or the other. There's a side to me that sometimes just like craves a lifestyle where it's like, I have like such a small house and only what I need and just like a handful of food products that I know I enjoy and work well for me. And I don't even have the distraction of the other stuff. There's yeah. like a, there's like a, there's almost like a weight that comes off your shoulders when you can, when you think, yeah. even just thinking about it, like it's so simple. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that side of it too. And there's, there's a whole, you don't want to ostracize yourself too much and, I think, and I think you can kind of like, you can manipulate that a little bit where there's things that are like not specific to, uh, you know, th that's going to negatively impact the people around you or your experiences with them. Uh, so there's a balance like everything, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, it is one of those things where it's like, I'm going to benefit now and pay later a little yeah. bit too, where like, and, and Hey, if you go and you, you go out with some friends and, and, and drink, and you have memories that last a lifetime from that experience and you right. paid for it for a couple of days after, then, hey, maybe that's a fair trade-off from well, a life experience. So this one is interesting to me because I definitely recognized the boredom and the, the, the difference. The thing that, the, the question I can't quite answer, I think, with it is like, could I have remedied that with better preparation? Because mm -hmm. the scenario that put me on a treadmill for 100 miles was... You know, it was March, 2020, basically the cascade of every race on the planet got canceled. And I was in a position where I was going to be doing a runnable hundred miler, uh, on a track in mid to late April. So I had like the majority of my training under my belt. Mm -hmm. So I was like kind of putting the finishing touches on that. And I was like, oh, great. Here we are. Like, you know, what do I do with this fitness? Do I just scale back and hope the events come back in the fall and then peak again? Or do I find something to use this fitness for. And the treadmill was the closest thing to what I had been training for in terms of just like a mechanical, like flat running essentially that I could, that I could think of. And, uh, my thought was, okay, well, I'll just live stream myself on a treadmill and see what happens. It ended up turning into like a quite a big event, but so you don't usually incorporate treadmill running into your running into your training. I don't not incorporate it. I just don't incorporate it in the way that would be necessarily conducive to uh, you know, dealing with the mental aspects of being on a treadmill for a hundred miles. <laughs> was it that different than running on a track? 
It was from the sense that here's the way I describe it is when I'm on a track, it's a controlled environment and everything can be very uniform, but there are tiny little micro adjustments and pace that that I'm doing subconsciously that give me the sense of control. Right. You know, I, I might run the exact same gotcha. split, but there's like a, a fraction of a second or you know, a fraction of a second faster than a fraction of a second slower that equals the same outcome. It gives you that sense of control. You're yeah. determining how fast you're going. On a treadmill, you're responding to the belt. So the advantage is you can set a pace and know you're hitting it. The disadvantage is you're being told what to do by that machine. And that gets very frustrating. Um, I've felt like I wanted to step off. Like you get to like certain points where you're just like, that's fascinating. Like even stepping off, what I noticed, I learned this on the day of actually, like I noticed there's something where it didn't really matter how long I get off. Like I get off to use the bathroom and that was a little bit of a longer break. Then I uh, some we, I had I had like a, a hiccup during my event where we ran so much power through one end of the house that the screen on the treadmill was blacking out. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we ended up, so I ended up jumping back and forth on treadmills for quite a bit in the beginning. And I noticed even turning it off, stepping on the other one and starting the other one up gave me like, you know, a handful of seconds between was enough of a mental break of just like that release of being told oh, what shit. to do yeah. to reset. Yeah. The, funny, the funny thing though about the treadmill is I actually like to do faster workouts on the treadmill, like long intervals or something like that or tempo runs because for that, for that type of stuff, sometimes for those, I want to release the brain power required right. to hit that pace and say, you yeah. take care of that. Yep. And, and for that, it's fun, but those are over quick. So you don't really yeah. run into the times. I love Bert because he's such a nice person. Like, I mean, as a guy who's just accelerated in popularity over the last few years, like he is like super kind. So for folks who are curious, like I, I've met Bert a couple of years earlier and I just, randomly asked him like hey i'm doing this live stream thing we're doing it for fight for the forgotten we're trying to raise some funds for them would you want to come on the live stream for a bit and i thought maybe he'd come on for like five or ten minutes and yeah. i thought that'd be amazing if he did that he ended up coming on for like over an hour he said he went past his slot sat in the next slot and just started talking with some of the other guests <laughs> and it's just he's just uh bert is definitely like i feel like he's as unchanged from like his popularity as one can get away with mm -hmm. and it's just like his his lifestyle, I think, is very un, unpredictable in the sense that like if he wants to run like X time for a specific race, that's going to pull away from his lifestyle so much to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Luckily for him, he's actually a great athlete. Like it, it's, it's under that layer of... Uh... Yeah. And there's definitely like a switch that flips when you, in your mind, decide I'm going to do this, yeah. where then all of a sudden it goes from like, you stop thinking about, oh, I, that's not possible to like, well, I'm just going to do it. And I think Bert highlights that perfectly in a lot of cases where like, he's, he's maybe not even thinking it through enough to get to the point where it's like, he gets the point where he thinks this is not possible, where most people would look at it and think, huh, I don't know if I can actually physically accomplish that task. Bert's just like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. And my, my thing, thought with Bert was the 2000 mile thing is where are we going to find him at the end of the year with like 36 hours to go on a hundred miles and he's going right. to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, you know, one thing that is exciting about ultra marathons, I think in a lot of places, especially early in someone's ultra marathon adventure, if they decide to do that as a, you know, part of their life is you have like these early years where you're doing things for the first time and it's like so cool and scary at the same time to think today I'm going to run hundred miles and the furthest I've ever run before is 50 or something like that. And you just know you're going to do something that you've never done before. You're going to experience things you would have never been able to predict. Uh, and it's like this really interesting, unique, like human experience, I think. So for me, I've spent most of my career at this point, like doing, I got through that phase in a lot of the events I'm really interested in. And then it was like, now let's repeat it and see if we can do it better. Mm -hmm. And you get into that mindset for a while, which is also a fun mindset, but there is that kind of like uh, um, desire to kind of have that human experience again of like, you know, not knowing what could happen or is this doable type of a thing, but still doing it and figuring it out along the way. So I would describe the Transcontinental Project as something like that. It's not anything unique to me or anything new. There's been a lot of people who've done it before, uh, but essentially it's a route. Uh, there's different routes. There's one kind of main one that's done for like, the, that is used as the record route, more or less, that you go from San Francisco to New York, and essentially you live out oh, of wow. an RV. 
uh, while you're running. So you run as much as you can during the day, then you go to bed at night, and then you get up and do it again. And you're you're handling all the logistics and the process of trying to make sure you can get up the next day and do again what you did the day before, which is going to be the biggest difference. So for me, I've done all single day ultra marathons where you're going to wring yourself dry at knowing the next day or week or however long you need, you're going to be able to just kind of like shut everything down and let everything catch back up. Whereas with this, like, you know, <laughs> you're doing it again and again, and again. Yeah. And, you know, the record is by a guy named Pete Kostelnik who averaged just over 72 miles a day, finished in 42 days, six hours and 30 minutes. And I mean, just like 72 miles, 73 uh, miles, and then like next day again, next day again, just knowing every day when you finish, you spend a whole day running and then, okay, I'm gonna go to bed. I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I'm gonna have to do this again. And then, you know, have that happen for six weeks. And that's if it goes very well. So luck, I assume is a big part of this. Like yeah, for sure. I mean, there's just so many variables that are uncontrollable on this type of an experience, just because like, I mean, you go over the Sierras, maybe you hit a storm, you know, you try to time it. Most people do it in sep start in September. So you can get over the mountain passes without a big storm coming through, uh, but then also get to the East Coast before it's like the middle of winter. So like September, early September start is kind of ideal, uh, but you can, you know, I mean, Pete was very fortunate from a weather standpoint. I think he made one big mistake. We got a little too aggressive in the beginning, had to take a full day off. So he actually averaged from a moving day standpoint, closer to 75 miles per day. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's gonna be things that I can't pre prepare for, or won't know if it's gonna happen. And, you know, a lot of that will get, a lot of the logistical stuff will get leaned on with the crew. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that's the hardest part right now is just like getting all of that put together where it's like, okay, I need to have the RV ready. I need to have all the stuff. I we need to have the places figured out where we're going to stop. And, and the people that can, you know, dedicate that much time to a, a, an activity like that, you know, there's a lot of moving parts even before you start the adventure itself. <music> Yeah, so I'll be documenting everything because uh, I mean, my hope is that I'm doing it primarily to raise awareness for Fight for the Forgotten, Justin Wren's charity. Uh, but with that said, I think I am capable of uh, if I have a good experience, uh, you know, chasing the record or going after the record or at least getting close to it. So, oh shit! So I'm, you're gonna try to beat this record? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out with the I'm gonna structure the process in a way that leaves that door open is the way I would describe it. I'm gonna try not to do anything that would potentially put it in a situation where that becomes the primary goal, just because I wanna make sure that, the reason I decided to do it in the first place was for Fight for the Forgotten. So I wanna make sure that I don't end up two thirds way across the country with a broken leg and I'm like, hey guys, uh, I guess the donation button's turned off. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm worried about it. I mean, I think there's probably, there's remote enough spots along the way where you'll get some alone time more more likely. I don't necessarily mind if people want to jump in. There'll there'll be some people that will definitely want to do that and and they can come in. And But the reality is like, it's probably not going to be a scenario where there's like, you know, 40 people following me at all times. <laughs> yeah, so the way I'm looking at this is it's much less about performance from the traditional sense where I need to be able to be X fit. I think I need to be injury proof. That's what's gonna right. be a, a, a detriment. If you think about it, like if I managed to average nine minute mile pace for a day, that would be 80 miles in a 12 hour time frame. So I'll easily have 12 hours of moving time per day. Um, nine minute pace I think is slow enough that it's not an unreasonable clip. So like, when you, st I mean, obviously there's things that slow you down or I I'll probably take walking breaks, you know, stopping breaks. You got to stay on top of nutrition. That's the other big thing too. I'm, you know, probably eating like anywhere between 10 to 15,000 calories a day, which is, yeah. you know, I could probably count on my hand a couple of occasions where I've eaten that much in my life. So now I got to do that for six plus weeks in a row. That's it. Yeah, that's probably like from from the first step to the last step, it'll probably be somewhere around like say 14 hours, 13 hours or something like that would be a pretty good estimate. Possibility of injury. And that's that's where I'm putting a lot of my focus in is uh, I think like just being running fit is going to be like generally speaking is going to be important. I'm going to, I think just from a lifetime of running is going to be a huge advantage. Uh, a lot of these like kind of like mechanical movements are going to be very established. It's just going to be about, can I tolerate that volume of it? Mm -hmm. 
there, I think that I'm, I'm doing more strength work. I think this is something where it's like, you know, maybe adding five pounds of lower body muscle is going to be an advantage versus a disadvantage when you're looking at power weight ratio. Cause I just don't, really don't, I don't, I never need to be running a 648 mile <laughs> for this adventure. Um, and I, so I'm looking at that. I'm, I'm doing a lot more of that stuff, focusing on that. The training is changing a fair bit where it's more polarizing versus kind of being, I mean, I've always had some polarization in my training, but this is even to an extreme where like, I'm going to do some simulations where, uh, you know, I go out and do two or three days where I target the exact thing I will be doing on the transcon. Just to kind of start to weed out where are the potential problems. So let's say I do a, a two or three day simulation where I'm averaging 70 miles a day. And I find out at the end of three days, there's a really weak spot here. Um, I need to address that or I need to find a way to make that not a weak spot. I think that's the only way to really get as close as you can to avoiding injury. Have you done that yet? Have you done a two day, 70 mile? Like even that's incredibly difficult. I haven't yet. I'm going to build up to it because that's the other thing too is I, I don't think you want to be so aggressive with that where you get injured trying to figure out how not to get injured. Uh, so I'll, I'll, what I'm going to start, what I just started last week is I've, uh, it looks really weird on my training schedule. Cause like last week I ran almost 150 miles, but I took two days off. So it's <laughs> like, usually for me to get to 150 miles, that's a seven day training week. <laughs> uh, so that's the way I'm doing it. Like I did, I did a day where I did, uh, you know, two, like just over 20 milers, separated with by just a couple hours and within that couple hours i did like a three three mile walk the following morning i woke up and ran i think it was like just over 36 miles first thing in the morning mm -hmm. just to get an idea of just like kind of like what is it like to be i mean this was in phoenix too so it was 100 degrees for the majority of that so to suffer then rest yeah then suffer again how, how that feels there's enough precedent with this sort of a, an activity where like everyone i've talked to so far has told me like there is going to be like this kind of like gradual decline in the early stages where you're just like okay it's getting worse it's getting worse it's getting worse and you hit a point where you're just like it hits kind of rock bottom and then like it starts to kind of gradually improve so you yeah. kind of have to let yourself get it, it's weird i think i can maybe eliminate i'm trying to find a way to eliminate some of that by doing the simulations whereas i from what i've seen i haven't seen a lot of people do the simulation route yet I've seen people just do like a lot of training and then say like, okay, I'll, I'll spend the first seven to 10 days adapting to this and then I'll get comfortable mm -hmm. within this environment and be fine. Whereas I'm going to try to get to a point where like some of that is already kind of cleared up before I start, but not so much that I'm like adding like an extra essential week to the trip right. <laughs> with, worth of running. What, what, what do you think will be the hardest simulated run leading up to it? Like, will you do three days? Yeah, I think I'll probably try to do three days somewhere between 70 and 80 miles each will be kind of like the goal. Would um, that be in August, you think? How close to? Yeah, I would like it to be in August. Like early August would be ideal. I think like maybe the first week in August because that gives me kind of three weeks to let things kind of settle down from that. But this then- This is crazy. This is incredible. <laughs> it's, it's actually interesting because like if I did, let's say I did the simulation now, um, the problem with that is like the adaptations from just like the breakdown and the strengthening would likely be gone unless I did it again. Uh, so I want to inch up to it mm -hmm. so that like, and get close enough to the starting date so that I'm still kind of like, you know, holding on to that adaptation when I start it. So then those first few days maybe aren't quite as miserable. Yeah. So that's what the record is almost exactly six weeks and that's at 72 and a half miles per day. So will you be posting online and like, yep. get, like yeah, people? Instagram is going to be a big one. I think I might do a few like YouTube stuff along the way too. Um, yeah, I'm still ironing out exactly how much I think at minimum I'll do, I'll do some Instagram stuff. I think I'll go live on Instagram a few times during the day when I take like walking breaks, uh, partly just to kind of, I think keeping people in, I mean, it stays true to the, the goal of raising awareness, but it also, I find when you bring people in, there is an added pressure to that, but it, there's yeah. also this sense that I've learned from the treadmill experience since we had like a pretty big production for that in the sense that, I mean, as much as you can turn on a camera in your own house, but like the, I remember thinking we had like 30 people lined up to come in and guest speak during that. And there was po points of that where I was like, you know, you get that voice we talked about at the beginning where it's like, you know, maybe you could quit. Like, do you really need to run a hundred miles on a treadmill? Is this yeah. really going to be valuable for you? Yeah. And then you think about, oh, you know what? There's uh, you know, Courtney DeWalter, one of the best female ultra runners to ever exist. 
is taking 30 minutes to an hour out of her day to come on in two hours to, you know, help me, you know, amplify this event. And do I really want to be sending emails out to these people saying, hey, guys, I know you were gracious enough to yeah. block out time of your day. You know, I think there's a little bit of that to do where you're like you're 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 ju jumping in with the community that is following along and saying, here's how things are going. Show them the best, the worst and everything in between. And then ultimately have that hold you accountable a little bit, too. It's like hard yeah, to get up in the morning and not go back out. Well, and one thing I'm going to definitely try to leverage to my advantage, and one of the reasons why I think Fight for the Forgotten was the charity that really triggered me to decide to do this. The transcontinental route was something I learned about early in my ultra running career, and I thought to myself, I want to do that someday, but it was one of those kind of far off distance things that it never really like actualized in your mind until you put a date down or you know mention it on the joe rogan experience or something yeah, exactly. like that when then it then it's like people want to know when is this happening and uh um you know the what, what i try to think about is you know the reason justin identified the pygmy tribe was because they were super forgotten where you know we think about just like some of these third world countries where it's a scenario of like some people, it's easy for us here in the U.S. to think to ourselves, well, why don't they just industrialize? Why don't they just like, you know, start to innovate a bit? Why are they so primitive? What, what's wrong with them? And in reality, like when you take, uh, when you scale things down to the degree where you need the entire day because of the situation you're in just to take care of your basic needs of water and food, mm -hmm. you never get the opportunity to even build a real like establishment or, you know, a build on that. Like you need, you need the free time or you need a portion of your population to have the free time available to innovate. Mm -hmm. And the Pygmy tribe just hadn't had that historically. In fact, they weren't even considered humans by like the, the local government for quite some time. And, you know, the, the people that really pay the price in some of these situations are the women because they're the ones that get saddled with like the water gathering and things like that. So the reason that Justin picked wells to build was because he thought to himself, if we can get them wells, then now these women don't have to spend all day walking and carrying water. Now they can just get that water. And now we have half their population freed up for other things. Now maybe they can start farms. They can build some housing and stuff like that. And it just, it exponentially improves once you take care of some of those big key early things. So when I'm thinking about like, you know, do I really need to go out here and travel another 12 hours a day? My mind's going to hopefully go to, well, if one of those women woke up in the pygmy tribe one morning and decided, you know what, do I really need to go get water today? Right. It's like, well, yeah, you do. <laughs> you, you really do have to. Yeah, you're running for them. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, and that that will give you fuel, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, the reality is always there where I don't have to do it. Like they yeah. do have to do it. So you know, but I think just keeping that perspective, it it puts us back to the beginning where it, it's this is one of those situations where I think it's like uh the a no quit situation you have to put yourself in a no quit situation here because it's uh you know it's just bigger than you yeah i sent him i sent him a note a while back because he was the first spot i mentioned it on so i think he, he knows I'm, I'm not sure if he's followed along about the exact starting date or not. oh that's a good question um i think i'd probably go maybe two directions here. Uh, I think uh, Heli Gaberlassi is one of the best, in my opinion, because just, I mean, 27 world records, <laughs> like, like not all the different distance, but like breaking and re-breaking and that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, he ran two, what was it, 203, 59 before the shoe technology came in that is estimated at anywhere between a two to eight percent performance advantage We're talking about a two hour marathon two zero three yep mm -hmm. two hour three minutes yep. marathon. yeah so he did that with the old shoe technology which uh essentially dates back to anything if if you were a nike athlete it could date back to as early as i think early 2016 is when the first prototype started showing up uh so if you're before that in your career you were using you're guaranteed to be using the old shoe technology um, and I mean, just the range of it too. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, there's, there, it's a, is he a marathon runner purely? 
No, he did everything. That's why I pick him. I think because he 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 went everywhere, everything from the eight hundred and is like at a national 800? level. Eight hundred, yeah, at a national level. I don't. He wasn't competing on at, at, at like Olympics or anything in the eight hundred, but he was he was mostly like five k to marathon. Um, yeah, yeah. So just incredible. I mean, I, th I I could go a totally different direction too. I think like Steve Prefontaine stands out in as an American runner just because if you look at it outside of just like performances and stuff like that, I think. Um, he basically like you can't find an american male runner who probably didn't get some motivation or some catalyst into their running journey from a prefontaine story i think there's a few things i mean there's a lot of things which is why he is who he is it's uh one was just his attitude about it where um he wasn't like this picture ask runner uh, i mean he was obviously talented but you know, you have the perfect story of like he wanted to be good at something. He, like most American kids, tried football. It was, you know, no hard work was going to get Prefontaine starting in varsity for football. Starts running, fell in love with the mile. Uh, his college coach told him, "No, you're not going to be a miler. You're going to be a 5K guy." And he popularized the 5K in the United States or three mile in some cases. And uh, I mean, he the way he would race, I think, is what really made him interesting for po folks. Where he would he was just like all guts runner where he's like, he's like, I mean, one of his famous quotes was like, he, if you, you, if you beat me, you're going to have to bleed to do it. Cause he's going to be an all guts race. And in a sport where it gets very tactical at times, especially at the like national, or at, I shouldn't say national, but at the like competition level, the championship level, where it's like kind of more of a sit and kick approach a lot of times where everyone's kind of waiting for someone to make a move. Like pre was going to make a move <laughs> really early. <laughs> You know, I think this is really different. Some people thrive under it where it's like for them, um, like I talked about Jim Walmsley before, I think he loves being in the front. If he's in the front, he loves it. That's where he's excited. That's where he knows he's he's doing what he's doing, where he's pushing his limits and things like that. Uh, Pre was probably the same way. And then I think there's other folks who are much more comfortable kind of saying, let's let things settle down here a little bit. And uh, then I'll make my move when it's time to make my move. Or they think of it as, and this is a very important, I think, lesson for for the average ultra runner is just like knowing what you're capable of is going to be an important piece to the puzzle because you can like you 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 can try to say I want to run faster than I'm capable of in an early part of a hundred miler, but then you're going to pay for it at the end. So really, unless you're trying to go for the win and that's a tactic that you think is going to produce a win versus trying to run your fastest time, you got to run within yourself within your parameters. Obviously, there's a big question about where those parameters are in a lot right. of cases, which makes ultra marathon even more interesting because it's like there's so much unknown about it. It's like, well, maybe you can go faster and we just don't know yet. Yeah, explore the unknown. Explore it's, the it's, unknown. Like, it's like a pioneer spirit, right? Yeah. You know, the next frontier kind of a thing. But I mean, Prefontaine, also there's other angles with him too, where he was like in the amateur era where to be an Olympian, you couldn't be pro. So he's turning down. I mean, the guy was on food stamps and living in a trailer because he wanted to run at the Olympics. And there was a lot of like politics involved with not being able to take, take sponsorship money and things like that, which has changed since then. But uh, so he was huge in the movement for that to kind of like, uh, you know, have a situation where now as an athlete, you can finish, in most cases, finish college, sign a big contract with, uh, you know, a sponsor, and then also still compete in the Olympic Games and go to the events that are actually ones that are going to likely catapult your career in most of the Olympic distance endurance events. So so he just revolutionized the sport. And then to add even more flavor to the whole thing, I mean, he died a very premature death. He got in a car accident and died before he would have likely probably medaled at the Olympics. So he- And there is a tragedy, the yeah. fact that he didn't- mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he was fourth place at the Olympics the prior, his first go of it. And it was kind of one of those things where it's like fourth place at the Olympics is the first man looking out or the first woman looking out. And for a guy that had as much hype as him, I think like a medal was something he really wanted to take home with him there. And Right, yeah. And well, it makes, I mean, it makes life like a movie almost where yeah, like, exactly you know, if everything's all sunshine and rainbows then it's not as entertaining to watch you yeah know, there's no adversity to overcome i would say in ultra running it's had much of a less of an impact because ultra running is still heavily skewed towards the trails 
So the technology, at least from what we know, isn't necessarily translating over to these like massive, varied terrains, certainly not the technical terrain and things like that. Now on road races, flat stuff, like the track stuff, the roads, the run, I guess you, a runnable trail um, where it's just like basically crushed limestone more or less, hmm. uh, you definitely get an advantage from it. It's, uh, and essentially what, what happened um, is in, it, this probably dated back actually before 2015, uh, you know, Nike decided, well, their, 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 their uh, development team uh, was ahead of the curve. They developed this new foam, they call it like a Peebok foam. Uh, and they, they realized that like when you step down into a shoe, the reason like, uh, racers, a lot of times would wear these flats is because they're trying to take out any of that lost energy into the foam in the shoe. Mm -hmm. Well, this foam that Nike came out with is so good that it actually returns way more energy than the average foam did to the point where like when they test these things on like force plate treadmills and things like that, it's like a, depending on the person's gait. And some of the things is like a two to eight percent improvement in wow. performance. I mean, we've seen records just across the board get broken since this came out. All distances, basically, yeah, yeah. I, th I think from at least from the five k up through the marathon, and I mean, we've seen some insane improvements in the marathon. I think like uh, the women's marathon went from a what was considered a relatively untouchable like two sixteen to a two fourteen, and I mean, like it was like two eighteen was like just world class like if you could run a 218 marathon as a woman that was like i mean it still is to a degree but then you know now you have someone run a 214 <laughs> like that's a huge and you attribute jump. a lot of that to the the shoe yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think there's probably other things that come in mind too like now that people know there's a performance advantage from a mechanical standpoint it's also a confidence thing where it's like oh now i can probably try going five seconds per mile faster and maybe they could have anyway and they just now they think they can so they are so there's probably a little bit of that that's just adding to it yeah so they can definitely go much more advantage they put a cap on it essentially so there was a there's also a carbon plate element to this too where they put like this carbon plate in there in between the foam so like i believe when when kipchoge broke well when they did that 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 kind of uh uh the sub two hour project he actually had on a shoe, if I'm not mistaken, that never got to market because they put down some parameters on it after, uh, before it, that one came to market where it was actually like stacked up to, I can't remember how many millimeters, it was an insane amount. And they had like, I think maybe even three layer plates in there. And that was a Nike shoe he was wearing? Yeah. Yeah. So what makes it kind of controversial or difficult is Nike came out with these prototypes. So a prototype for people that don't understand shoes, like these, these companies, they'll develop a shoe and it usually takes like somewhere in the neighborhood of like probably 18 months to hit the market. So if you're like a sponsored athlete or work for the company, you can get your hands on these shoes before they actually come to market. Mm -hmm. So we had an issue. I think this wasn't necessarily as big of an issue in the ultra running community, but uh, in the track and field Olympic distance stuff was a big issue because you had Nike athletes having these prototype shoes before anyone could get them. And then you had athletes who were sponsored by these other brands who couldn't wear them even if, even when they did come to market. So then we had this like chase to catch up where uh, other companies are starting to make their own version of it. And now we're getting to a point where most companies have a version of that shoe. Um, but we had a huge transition phase that impacted the Olympics big time. I mean, think of here, here's a, here's an example of it. Uh, there's a, there was a an athlete, Kara Goucher. Um, she was not. She was a Nike athlete. wasn't uh, when they came out with this shoe, and she ran the Olympic trial marathon and got fourth place, the first person out. Mm -hmm. And uh, two of the people had ever had that shoe on, and she was maybe a minute or two. Like, I'd have to look to see exactly, but it was within the the, the performance advantage range. And so you could argue that she was the first person in modern running to lose an Olympic spot due to a technological disadvantage. Wow. And, and it's like, I mean, it's, it's one profound. of those, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where like, um, it's, it's a transition, right? So there's going to be bumpy road and there's going to be people that get caught in that transition that it's unfortunate for, but it's also like, uh, you know, once everything does catch up and every shoe company has a version of this, there's still problems. I mean, these are incredibly expensive shoes. It's like a $250 shoe. So it's like, at what point do you tell like a wealthy family with a high school kid that, 
you know, you can get that $250 shoe, but then you go and this kid's family can barely afford a pair of shoes for them, much less a $250 pair of shoes. Like, where do we draw that line and that sort of stuff? Um, also just, here's the other big one. Like let's, I mean, two to 8% is a massive range. What if you're on the 2% versus someone's on the 8%, you know, chances are if you're, you know, blowing a record out of the water, you're probably closer to that high end percentage versus someone who's maybe getting incremental gains. You're probably closer to that lower end. So is it fair to have a piece of equipment that has that big of a range when we're talking about less than a percent determining these races when all is held constant? It, it'll, it'll get a lot more complicated. <laughs> so it's nice when you have like a particular piece of technology that's just like right there. It's a shoe. We can understand it. We can study it. Right. Yeah. And we may, we may be coming on the precipice of like human powered sport performance is no longer being something that we like look at as this like pinnacle of uh, like, I, guess, I don't know, maybe entertainment's the wrong word, but like, is that a pursuit? You know, do we end up just going a different direction? I mean, I think it's like, it's so hard for us to think about that right now because it's so part of like the culture and the lifestyle of the average person where like sport is a hobby of theirs as well as a passion to follow. And it's like, how complicated does it need to get before people lose that interest? Well, and in reality, we've been dealing with this problem in other areas, just with the performance enhancing side of things with drugs and all that stuff too. And anyway, that, that conversations flared back up with track and field too, where we are seeing a lot of records get broken. A lot of it probably is to shoot technology, but you know, in, in 2020 with the COVID stuff, you, you have all these out of competition testing protocols that a lot of these top tier Olympic athletes are getting, uh, to try to eliminate like it like if you just do inter competition testing like there's potential for people to do things that are uh going to give them a performance advantage but not going to show up on that test on the day of or the, after their race where now you have these like limitations of being able to test so do we have a cr like a group of athletes now who decide oh i'm not going to get tested in 2020 due to the covid restrictions this is the time to dope up and then you know hit some stride and some records and then you know taper back off when they get this thing fired back up again and mm -hmm. so there may be some of that as well and i mean that's always been an ongoing problem and that yeah uh, we're running <laughs> and who knows like maybe that's already over who knows who's who's modified that. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think yeah, there's no question about it, regardless of technology, he's world-class, if not the best. Um, the, the, I think he, I think he could go under two or someone equivalent to him could go under two hours with with the shoe technology, probably it, what it'll take is it'll take a fast course, a course that has like very few tangents because like, it, you know, turning on a course, they estimate adds about a percent to the, to the wow. distance. So, you know, when we're talking about a marathon, you're getting up to like a quarter mile extra running, you know, that alone could potentially put you down near, near too flat based on what, you know, we're seeing. Cause I mean, Kipchoge, has got a, was it 201? 40, I believe is his actual world record mm -hmm. where it's actually like, you know, certified. So, I mean, he's right on the door, knocking, knocking on the door there. Um, yeah, the prototype he had since then, they put in a regulation where you can't stack a shoe for the roads more than 40 millimeters. So you can only have so much of that energy returning foam and you can only have, I think one carbon plate in there now. Uh, so that puts a little bit of a ceiling on that technological thing. Uh, but, but who knows what else will come out in that. And, 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 and uh, to be honest, who comes out with it? Because the fact that Nike came out with this technology is the reason why it's being allowed to be, be used. If it would have been like, you know, another running company that, that came out with it, I'm sure the, 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 the regulations would have been slapped down on it immediately. And they would have probably just thrown it out altogether. It would have oh, been so this politics. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and I mean, it's, <laughs> it, you can go, you can go super like, you know, negative with that and say like, Hey, like, this is like, this is terrible. Or this is like super nefarious when in reality, it's like, you know, you have a company that has, you know, billions of dollars and is interested enough in the sport that otherwise doesn't generate a ton of revenue to, you know, pick up a big tab and support like, uh, you know, track and field and things like that. But, you know, with that, you know, you, if you want to be the guy who says, yeah, thanks for the millions and millions of dollars, but we're going to, all those years and money you spent on that foam, 
eh, you wasted it. We're not going to let you use it. But, you know, if you're another company who, uh, you know, revolutionizes the sport in potentially a negative way, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you say no to them. So yeah. it, it gets interesting. That's the way. That's how it always humanity. happens. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> There's really no way. I, mean, I think ultra for sure, because that is a fastly growing sport yeah. and it's, it, there's there's a lot of potential for much bigger pop or much pool bigger pool of like talent to pull from uh that could really push the needle down on some of these performances and things like that uh especially as it becomes more popular if if, if people start realizing or I shouldn't say realizing but if a scenario happens where like oh I'm one of the best endurance athletes in the world I make more money running ultra marathons mm -hmm. than I do running the marathon then you know all of a sudden we see every record get broken in a matter of a couple of years uh but the the for the marathon I mean it's going <laughs> to get faster I think but like to what degree is so hard to know yeah. it's very hard to know and the, it's, the one hour and 40 minutes seems like that's pretty fast <laughs> that's, that's very fast I mean for folks for some perspective there the current world record is like in the 440s mm -hmm. per mile per mile like uh, just to add a little flavor to that you're basically sprinting yeah I mean go out to a track yeah. and run one lap as fast as you can and then reflect on what time you get and realize like the world record for the marathon is that is that lap at just over 70 seconds per lap so minute and 10 just over that but you're doing it 26.2 miles yeah. so so over 100 times it's mind boggling i think i'd be more inclined just cuz it stands out to me much bigger than any one like hard decision or outcome ahead from a particular race is just like the trajectory of like, you know, doing what I'm doing now is so much different from what I would have ever expected. Uh, you know, I mean, I was a talented enough runner where I could make the state meet by my senior year at a small division three school and, you know, compete at a, a division three college and be pretty modest talent comp comparative to my, to my peers at the top level of division three. Um, to think that like I'd be doing anything that was revolved around running as as an occupation is is uh, I still second guess that that's actually occurring it makes me wonder about the whole simulation theory thing. <laughs> it's like who's, like who's got my joystick and exactly. what do I do with it? But, uh, but <laughs> they got reality, the cheat codes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I mean, I went to school to be a teacher, and I really loved that profession. I taught for about five years, and I I got to a point where you know, some of it's just perfect timing too, like the sport gained enough popularity where there was enough money in it where like you know, I could start a coaching business, I could get sponsorships and things like that and actually look at it and say financially I can make a go of this or at least risk it. But there's such a fine line between like deciding to do that or kind of staying comfortable because, uh, I mean, I was at the perfect teaching spot for me. I was at this uh, like project-based learning school and just outside of Madison, Wisconsin, loved it. Um, one of the hardest decisions in my life to make was to step away from that, to pursue running it more holistically. Um, and I mean, I almost didn't. I had a, a co-teacher who was, uh, I was thinking to myself, I knew that it was like a decision I was gonna have to make the next few years, but it was such an easy decision to say, well, wait one, one more year. And he was just like, he was a little more of a free spirit than I was certainly at the time. He's like, dude, what are you waiting for? Just go. <laughs> just go. Like, why, why are you here? Like, like after I told him that, he like every time we'd, we'd I'd come into I'd come into school the next day and he'd be like, why are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was there's a like, tongue in cheek for sure. But uh... in some regards, it's a blessing in the sense that like uh, you know failing would have been fairly predictable right <laughs> whereas if like you know i always wonder I, I mean i think of these like especially the big sports like baseball football and basketball and you get you know guys who guys and girls who are like identified in like early high school as being the next and it's like what kind of pressure is that to think like well if i'm not like literally one of the best players in the nba in 10 years i failed yeah isn't that, it's just mind-boggling to think if i'm not one of the best at one of the most competitive sports on the planet in what is an athletic, I think an athletic state of an NBA basketball player is probably one of the most athletic human beings on the planet. And, and to know like at, in a teenage year that your, 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 your success bar is being the best, one of the best in the league or the best ever. And that conversation is floating around everywhere you look and see versus, 
being able to kind of quietly fail and go back to teaching <laughs> it <laughs> makes it a little more digestible i think yeah i think uh you know one thing i was always interested when i was teaching was like you'd have these you'd have students who had like interests they had what they were good at and sometimes those ran in in unison with one another other times they didn't and it was always interesting to me when you'd have a student who's like i'm really into like you know guitar or i'm really into skateboarding or something like that where it's like pretty small like success rate on that avenue versus what you can maybe accomplish by focusing on just something like a little more standard and i think like really like besides the likelihood of it becoming something you can turn into a profession or not, you should just ask yourself, like, is this something that I want to spend my free time doing? Uh, and because if it is, then you, you want to keep that in your life because that's something that's rewarding, motivating. It might be the catalyst that gets you out of bed in the morning and, you know, go to another job in order to go do that thing afterwards. And I think nowadays we're getting to a point where like the, your reachability from even a really small, like, unmonetized thing previously is now an option where if like you live in a city where there's only two other people interested in your topic of area, so you're not gonna be able to turn it into a job. Now with the internet, you have the world at your disposal. So that two to three people in every town can turn into thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of millions of people. And if you really focus your time and energy into that thing, then, you know, who knows where you can go and how much more enjoyable your life can be if you're able to turn your career into a passion of yours. So I think like, that is something I would tell tell people, um, focus on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I saw that all the time when I was teaching. I was dual certified. I was, uh, my, my certifications were in history and broadfield social studies. So like econ, uh, psychology, history, all that stuff. And then I also had a certification in special education, which was, you know, people think of special education a lot of times as like, oh, it's the, you know, the kid who is not smart enough to do the regular thing. When in reality, it's like, I mean, there is some, you know, I mean, there's obviously like, you know, like certain things like Down syndrome and stuff like that. But like, there's also like a huge population of groups of both like gifted and talented on one end of the spectrum where they're incredibly smart and they're like the geniuses. But for whatever reason, the standard method of learning does not click with them, does not work with them. And then they just need a slightly different path or maybe a drastically different path and they're gonna just flourish. And you have kids that end up falling on the other end where, you know, maybe it's really difficult for them to be able to read at the speed of other students. But if you give them this specific direction, they can just thrive in a certain area. And just seeing that, like the, you know, like the, that there's multiple ways to do stuff and there's not necessarily one path to the end is I think such an eye-opening thing to learn, especially if you learn, maybe that's what I should answer the question <laughs> that you asked me with is, you know, keep an open mind as to what paths there are forward and, know that, you know, maybe just because even even if you look to your left and you look to your right and all your classmates are successful doing it one way, it doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be the way for you. Well, thanks a bunch, Lex. It's been a, an honor to come on your podcast. I've been a fan of it for, uh, for quite some time. And um, I thought about wearing a white suit, but <laughs> Michael Malice already took care of that one. Took, so it was yeah. off the... <laughs> well... <laughs> Thanks a bunch. This is the Lex Free Podcast.